So if you are on um if you're on YouTube, I'm going to exit out and then I'm gonna come right back in and then I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna act like this is my first time coming in, you know, for um showing purposes. Okay. So I'll be right back and um uh, I'll do the welcomes and all of that. Okay. Okay, go along with it. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the How to Build Credit for Beginners impromptu webinar. I just put my presentation together like an hour before showtime, but that's not the important part. You know, the important part is to give as much value and as much knowledge as I can and pack as much information as I can within the next 60 minutes. So if you are new to building, whether you are new to building credit, whether you are a veteran, whether you have been building credit for quite a quite some time and you you are just you know stuck in your current credit building or credit repair journey um this presentation is suitable for everyone every credit profile every credit score and every level of expertise in terms of building credit okay so i wanted to make sure that um i provided you guys with like i said as much information as i possibly can within the next hour so i only need your attention for an hour i hope everyone has a notebook a pen or whatever the case and um bonus points if you have your credit report but you don't need it you don't need it you don't need it however um definitely take notes now um the replay will be available on youtube only so on youtube you'll, you'll be able to see the full replay um there is no upselling to this webinar it is strictly information this may require a part two. I'll just say that because like I said, we do have an hour and I'm very detailed, extremely detailed in um, how I like to, to teach, right? Um, feel free to screenshot any slide. And also um, I'll, I'll figure out a way to post the link to the slide so you guys can download it for, you know, later, right? If you're in Credit Academy, first of all, shout out to you guys. Um, you guys will have, you know, the replay as well as the slides, of course. All right, so we are about to begin. Um, before I begin to make sure that we're all on the same page, if you're on YouTube, if you're on Instagram and TikTok, YouTube is getting the, be the best view because they get the webinar. So they'll be able to see the slideshows and all of that. So if you're a visual learner, I would recommend that you come over to YouTube. Um, search my name on YouTube, Shonda Martin, and you'll, you'll see us. We're live, right? Now, if you're on either platform, press a one if you guys can hear me and see me clearly in a charged phone. Exactly, exactly. Let me know if y'all can hear me before I start, because once I start, I'm not even going to look at the comments because I'm trying to to get through the presentation. We only got an hour. We only got an hour, child. So I'm trying to take full fledged advantage of uh, the full hour. All right. One, 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 one. OK, cool. And also just to kind of see, just to kind of get a gauge on who's in attendance. Press a one if you are completely new to building credit. Uh Enter a two if you have some experience with building credit, you're just uh, possibly like stuck or plateau. Your credit score is like plateaued and you just don't know what to do next. Um, and then put a three if you're experienced, like you have five plus years of building credit. Um, your credit score is good. You're kind of just here to, 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 to get a little, you know, information. All right. So I see a lot of ones, twos. Okay. See a few threes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right. Okay, good. All right, so real quick, can you guys see the presentation? Can you see the uh, slideshow? Two. Okay, so moderate. Mm, some beginners and then some, we do have a, a quite a few that has a moderate experience level in terms of building credit. Okay, if you're on TikTok, you're not going to see the slideshow because I can't share my screen. So you'll have to go to YouTube, which if you search my name, Shonda Martin, is also linked in my profile. So search my name and you'll see uh, the live video as well as Instagram. All right, so we're gonna begin, y'all, we're gonna begin. 
Okay, cool. Y'all can see the presentation. All right, let me test it. Okay, cool. All right. So, welcome to Building Credit for Beginners. This is a foolproof, proven method um, in terms of building your credit, setting your credit profile up, establishing credit, and putting putting your play or, or um, getting your credit profile to a position or to an area or an arena so that you can aid to its growth, right? So we never want to plateau for too long, you know, as it pertains to your credit profile, unless you have like, you know, amazing credit. Of course you want it to stay there, but when it comes to building your credit and establishing your credit profile, it is super is essential with how you start it, right? Um, and if you've already started it, it's not too late. You may just need to add or take away a few things so that you are uh, not missing the mark or making sure you're hitting every mark that you possibly could. All right. And I'll go further into that in just a second. So and we're starting from uh, the tippy top, like the very beginning. OK. All right. So I'm not going to be looking at comments. We will have a Q&A section at the end starting now. All right. All right. So number one, when it comes to building credit or increasing your credit score and increasing your borrowing power, which is more important, you need to know exactly what goes into your credit score. So everyone knows that, you know, the highest credit score, the highest lending score you can achieve is a 850. Right. We all know that. Um, however, most don't realize that the lowest credit score that anyone could possibly have is a 300. So it does not matter how many collections you have, how many charge offs, how many late payments, the lowest your credit score will go. And we're talking FICO, the lowest your credit score will go is a 300. So they give you 300, you get 300 points by simply existing or, or, or having credit, right? It does not matter how many bad accounts you have. You cannot go below 300. So you can't go below 300, but you also cannot go above 850 when it comes to your lending score. OK, so between 300 and 850, it leaves 550 points that you have the potential to add to your 300 points. So to add to your credit profile, obviously, the more the majority of those 550 points that you achieve the higher your credit score will be or the closer you will get to 850. 850 is considered a perfect score. You don't you don't got to get a perfect score in order to, you know, obtain like the, the the highest or top tier credit offers. However, getting as close as possible or getting as many of those 550 points as you possibly can would always um th th that that's the goal, right? Now, we know you have 550 points to grab, but what most don't know is that 550 points are actually allocated specifically to each category of your credit profile. What do I mean by that? OK, so there are five categories. There are five components that that uh, goes into the pie or the breakdown of your credit score. The number one component is payment history. Then we have credit utilization. Then we have credit age you have hard increase. And then the last and final component is your credit mix. All of those, each section or each category of your credit score is weighed differently. And they each impact your credit score in a different manner. So your payment history, as I stated, that's the largest portion of your credit profile. So of those 550 points, payment history is solely responsible for 192.5 of those. Okay. Credit utilization is responsible for 165 of those 550 points. Credit age is takes up about 82.5 points. Your hard increase take up 55 points. And then your credit mix also is identical to your hard increase. And it takes up 55 points as well. OK, so when you add all of those together, payment history, 192.5 plus credit utilization, 165 plus credit age, which is 82.5 then hard increase, which are 55, and then credit mix 55, you'll get 550 total points, okay? Um, many, every, usually um, when it comes to like your credit pro, your credit score breakdown, people will teach it in the sense of percentages. So you, you've you heard of the 35, 30, 15, 10, 10 rule, which is basically what you see on your screen. C payment history is 35% of your credit score. Credit utilization is 30% of your credit score. Credit age is 15%, hard increase and credit mix are both 10% each, right? 
for me, I, and I don't know if this will help you guys, but for me, it helped to quantify each category. So yes, I know the percentage, like yes, 35% is payment history, but what does that actually mean? Well, when I tell you that that 35% equates to 192.5 points, then it starts to make sense in your head in terms of how important each category is, right? Now, this is the total points that's allotted for each category. So obviously that means that in order to obtain a 850 credit score, you would have to be getting, like you would have to be hitting the mark in every single category and getting every single point available in every each each of the five categories, right? Um, what's the chances of that? It's not impossible. It's not impossible. Studies, do, studies does show that 12% uh, of the population has a perfect credit score. But I don't even need you to like trip on that because what I will tell you is you do not have to have a perfect credit score in order to uh, get the same offers, literally like be qualified for the same offers that that 12% um, has access to, right? Because lenders, which are banks, and you'll hear me reference lenders and um, creditors a lot, within this presentation. I'm just referring to the, the people that lend you money, whether that's a credit card, an installment, a home loan, whatever the case, right? The lenders, they do not expect you to have a perfect credit score because that's very rare. And if they only base their applications off the 12% the of the population, they wouldn't make any money, right? Um, and then another thing that you need to realize is they don't make their money off the top 12% understand that they make their money off the 82% of us who does not have a credit who who does not have a perfect credit score right mainly like the the people who has less than good credit score or even you know like the lower credit scores that that's where lenders make the bulk of their money so not only do they not expect you to have perfect credit but like it really does not feed their bottom line the better your credit is <laughs> you know so under like they'll accept you with open arms without you ever obtaining even near a um, perfect credit score, right? Now, so you guys you guys see the, the, the point breakdown, but I wanted to go further into that so you understand what has to happen or what you have to do in order to obtain all of or most or majority of the points that are allotted in each category, okay? So this list is a little off... Um, out of order, but I'm going to explain it within the same order that we just talked about, right? So payment history, like I said, that's a that's 35% of your credit score, also worth up to 192.5 points. What do you have to do to get the entire 192.5 points? Well, you would literally have to have a perfect payment history, meaning you cannot have a single lay payment within the history of your credit report. So within the last seven years, on all of your credit accounts, seven to 10 years, if you have like a bankruptcy, but within the last seven years of your credit report, you cannot have a single lay payment, right? Now, in addition to that, just because like you, you won't, you won't hit every single point unless, unless, unless you have at least 500 posted payments. So what many, what many people don't realize is not only does it matter the percentage of on-time payments that you have versus late payments, but another thing that matters and what all and what um helps to maximize those payment history points is the more on-time payments that you have reported to your credit profile, the more of those points you will be gaining access to. Okay. In, ad in addition to that, under 500 payments. So there are there are tiers to pretty much everything in credit. So you're going to to hear me reference tiers and thresholds and all of that because in in, in each category there there are like subcategories. It like it's very detailed. That's the that's um that's the reason why two people can have the same exact credit scores. However, their credit profiles are completely different. It's because there are so many subcategories under each category of your credit profile. And to and I don't want to confuse you guys. Excuse me. I don't want to confuse you guys, so I'm going to kind of just stick to the to the to the main differences, right? So for payment history, you'll have to be you you would in order to to obtain a hundred percent of the one hundred and ninety two point five points, you cannot have a single late payment in the last seven to ten years. You are, you have to have more than five hundred posted payments. Whenever you have less than five hundred payments, 
regardless of how high your credit score is, you are never your credit profile in terms of the rating, it will never be deemed a um experienced, right? So you have so so lenders internally, and I'm talking past your credit report, not on your consumer credit report, because the information that that you see on your consumer credit report is extremely limited. When a lender pulls your credit report, they have access to much more information. And also they grade your credit score an entire different way than what we view as when we like download our credit reports. So understand that, right? Unless you have at least 500 posted payments, your credit profile is not considered experienced. If you have 500 or more posted payments, regardless of like if you have collections or whatever the case may be, you are considered an experienced borrower. Whether your experience is good or bad, then that's that's up to you know the rest of the information on your credit report. However, the goal, if you want to obtain, like I'm talking the top, basically, regardless of the credit score that you're in, you having that 500 posted payments and I and hoping, you know, assuming that the the payments that you have posted are are uh positive, you are considered an experienced borrower. You'll 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 um be able to 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 gain access to those top offers from any any company, right? And understand that the payment, the payment, this is important for the people that you know like get authorized user accounts and all that. Your payment history is really based on 99.5%, I believe. So basically all of them, all of them are based on your primary uh accounts, your primary accounts. So Primary accounts are accounts that you were approved for and that are in your name. So it is you're not an authorized user. You're not a co-signer. It is you. You are the account holder. It is important when you are making up your credit profile and establishing credit to have primary accounts. Other accounts like authorized user and all of that, they can they inflate your credit score. Right. So so basically you may see an increase in your credit score. However, your credit profile is not matching your credit score, meaning that you have what's called an inflated credit score, meaning your borrowing power will not match your credit score. This is why you you, you see, um, this is why tons of people will have like great credit, like, you know, a 750 plus or a 730 plus, but they're still getting denied for credit offers, right? It's because their credit profile does not match their credit score. And you what you don't want is an inflated score. Like that does nothing for you except it look good on social media. It, outside of that, it does nothing for you. So they're like, don't waste your money, don't waste your time. Build your, make sure that your credit profile and your credit score is based on your primary accounts. Now, if you have a, a, a well, I'll get into that in the next category because I don't want to get too far off, you know, the topic, right? Now, credit utilization. The only way, and please hear me when I say this. There are 165 points that are allotted to you for credit utilization. Your credit card utilization is only based on credit cards, open credit cards. So let's just say you've had credit cards in the past and you've closed all of your credit cards. You are not you are not obtaining any of those points. When it comes to credit utilization, you're getting zero. You have to have an open credit card in order to even get a single point out of credit card utilization. Open, open. So if you don't have a credit card, you are giving up 30% of your credit profile. You are putting, you are setting aside on the table up to 165 points that you could have had, you know, if you just open up a credit card. Having a credit card is essential if you want to be taken at all seriously in any aspect. There is no way to build credit. And please hear me when I say this. I don't care what anyone else says. There is no way to build quality credit without a credit card. It is impossible. I, it does not. It, don't listen to anyone who tells you differently. 30% of your credit profile is literally based on your ability to manage a credit card properly. OK, so you can't you can't you can't you can't uh, installment your way out of that. Like you it is. There are no amount of loans that you can post on your credit profile or that you can have that will that will. Um, E equal up to what a credit what one credit card would do, would will do right loans are important because you know they 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 aid to your payment history and also your credit mix however your credit cards there is a there is a single category specifically based on credit cards for a reason guys that's simply because they are so important you can't you can't build good credit without a credit card 
I don't care what nobody say. You can't build a credit without a credit card, okay? So if you don't have a credit card, if you're choosing to not have a credit card, then just understand you are choosing to you are choosing to give up 30% of your credit profile. Also, understand that your borrowing power and your credit score will never will never exceed 100 or 665 and uh 75 points. That's the max you can get. If you were talking FICO, that's the max you can get without a credit card. And that may sound good to you, but you have to understand that that is the, the max you can get. So even so, if you get that max, that means that you are hitting the mark and getting every single point in every other category, which is highly unlikely if you if you don't have a credit card. Because number one, you won't even get everything for credit mix. Like you won't get all those points because you don't have a credit card. Okay. Um, also, when it comes to your credit age, your credit, your credit card is important for your credit age as well, because a credit card, which is a revolving trade line, is the only type of account that you can keep forever. Every other account type has a termination date, has a closing date. Your credit card, you can keep a credit card for as long as you want. So, I mean, if the company closes it because you are not handling it responsibly, then that's another thing. Um, or if you decide to close it, then again, that's another thing. However, you do have the ability to keep a credit card for life. You have the ability to keep a credit card for life. It is always best if you have not started building credit yet. If I, if I caught you before you started building credit, the best thing you could do for your credit profile is getting a credit card before an installment. Um, a mistake that a lot of us make, because I made this too, we'll have an installment first. Most likely it's like a student loan, because like you know, you get you get you start building credit at 18. The first account type you typically get are student loans, and then you start building credit. Understand that a student every loan, as in a student loan as well, will close. So when you have your, your credit age based off when and when someone says your credit age is based off something that mean your oldest account when you have your credit age based off based off an account that closes when you close that account you are going to lose a lot a lot a lot of credit age so to help that it's always best if, if it like i said if it's not too late to start your credit uh building process off with a credit card if you are a young adult if you're a parent and you and your child is is coming of age the best thing you can do is get them a credit card first. I'm talking on my kids' 18th birthday. They they applying for a credit card. They gonna be they're going to be on my credit card. Um, you know maybe when they turn 16, 17. However, the second that they turn 18, they're getting their own credit card because if I can go back in time, that's what I would have done. Like that's going to help them tremendously when it comes to building credit. Um, all right. So credit utilization, like I said, is worth 165 points. The only way you're going to get access to those 165 points is if, like I said, you have an open primary credit card and you have a regular, regular reported utilization between one and nine percent. One and nine percent, not 30, not 30. Y'all heard me cruelly when I said not 30, because please let that go. 30 percent is, is done. We are never going to abide by that rule ever again. If you are watching this, if you're viewing this. Let go of everything that you think that you knew or everything that you've learned previously about how to use a credit card, please. That's done. 30% is way too high. As you can see, based on this chart, 30% is considered fair. 30% is fair, right? So to keep it real with you guys, if you don't have a, a 700 credit score, you absolutely, you absolutely shouldn't be reporting anywhere near a 30% utilization. Every single one of my credit scores are over 800 and I still would never, never report anywhere near a 30% a utilization because that is, you are you are losing so many points. So of those 165 points, a 30% utilization will only gain you access to about 55, at most 68 of those points. So basically you're missing out on 100 points by reporting a 30% utilization. Um, in fact, that is the number one reason why most people will have a stagnant credit score. Like your credit score is not going to grow with a 30%. Is is you may you may gain a few points here and there. Um however, in terms of like seeing a continual growth within your credit score, it's not going to happen with a 30%. It's not going to happen. I'm sorry. Let that go. Um between 1 and 9% is 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 great. Between 10 and 29%, mm mm if you have to, like if it's do or die and you just can't, you know, like you can't afford it, you, you you've paid all you can pay, then okay, cool. 
But anything above 30 percent, there there is no way you are expecting your credit score to grow. No way. Right. Also, if you have a low limit credit card. You shouldn't be reporting over five percent and that's just off off record. Like you really should not be reporting over five percent on a low limit credit card. What's a low limit credit card? Any credit card under it's technically any credit card under 5000 however what i'm what i'm considering low in terms of like the conversation is anything under $1500 if you show a credit card company that um you cannot manage a $1500 credit limit then there is no way that they're going to trust you with 10000 20000 30000 40000 plus dollar credit cards like you can't expect the lender to think that you are going to suddenly um develop financial proper financial habits when you get a $20000 credit limit like, come on now. They look at your credit report. You have a $200 and a $500 credit card. The first thing they're going to do is say, okay, well, that is, by the way, and I'm talking in terms of lenders. This is not my opinion. In terms of lenders, $200 and $500 credit cards are basically any limit, like I said, under $5,000 really for like the top tier companies. They consider those like low level, low limit credit cards, right? So they consider those like beginner credit cards. Nothing is wrong with those, except the only thing that's wrong with those is uh carrying a balance or not even just carrying a balance but just like showing that you cannot you don't your 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 income um isn't enough to cover a low limit credit card that's the number one reason why most people are usually stuck under the uh fifteen hundred two thousand dollar credit card limits unless it's like navy federal and that that don't count but i'm saying in terms of like the the national banks like the bigger banks and stuff if you find yourself not getting approved for to be to keep it real with you guys, the ten thousand dollar credit limit is is it, it don't take much to get a ten thousand dollar credit limit, right? Only if your credit profile is set up correctly, right? Um, so one of the ways to set it up and make sure and ensure that you are your 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 borrowing power grows is to make sure that especially with low limit credit cards, make sure y'all don't carry a balance as much as you don't like. Try your hardest not to carry a balance. And we'll talk about how to properly pay in the dates and, and what's considered carrying a balance in just a second. But you want to get in the habit of showing that you are able to manage the current credit that you have, especially if you are still in a season of growing and, 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 and building, right? Once you get to where you want and you got the credit cards that you want, then, you know, you have a little more wiggle room. You can, you, 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 you have a little more freedom because you're not, you're not applying, right? You're gardening. You, you are, you're satisfied with the accounts that you have and you don't really, you're not in the market anymore. When you're still in the market and, and, and trying to obtain credit, everything about how you use your credit card makes a difference, right? Um, so yeah, one to nine percent is best. Not best, it's that's the limit. If 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 you are familiar with my teaching, you're familiar with my platform, you know that that under 10% rule is the ceiling. And I'm telling you guys, I know it may seem crazy, especially when you're used to hearing the 30%. I'm telling you, next month or whenever you can, report between 1% to 10% and then come back and comment and let me know the difference that it made in your profile. Because here's the thing, with a credit card, a credit card is also the account type that has the ability to like drastically change your credit score within a, a, a month, within a billing cycle. Within a billing cycle. That's the only account on your credit report that will make a difference within a month. Because if you have an installment, um, you every month that you pay that account, you're not gaining points. That's not how installments work. However, with a credit card, you go from you go from high utilization to low. You are going to see an immediate change in your credit profile by the time your credit uh, report updates. So within you know thirty to forty five days max. All right. All right. So the next case or the next um, category is your credit age. Your credit age, like I said, lends 82.5 points. The only way you're getting access to all 82.5 points is if you have an average of nine years. What's important to know about credit age, and I'll just skip through the last three of these. What's important to notate about credit age is it's an average. So you take your, your newest account age, your, your youngest account age, and then your oldest account age, and then you divide it by the total amount of accounts you have on your credit report. It's an average. So that means that anytime you add a new account on your credit report, you are losing credit age. So your credit age is, is de decreasing. Anytime, let's say you're repairing your credit and you're getting items deleted. Anytime something is deleted, you also take away at your credit age. 
um, every account on your credit report has an age. Every account, whether it's a good account or a bad account. So even charge-offs, um, collections, they all have a credit age. So that's that's why you um you can you can you can be repairing your credit and getting items deleted. And you'll notice that your credit score will will usually it typically decreases first, and then you'll start to see it rise up as you build credit. That's simply because, every, like I said, every account has a credit age. So if you're getting a collection that's seven years past or seven years old deleted, you lose seven years of credit age. That does not mean that does not mean that you should want to save that account or keep that account on your credit report just because it's seven years old. Understand that. Yes, every account has a credit age, but you don't want to like you. You should never prefer to keep bad credit age on your credit report for the sake of credit age. Does that make sense? Like just because a collection is six years old, that doesn't mean. And, and although when you when you get that account, account removed, most of the time you're going to lose a few points. That does not mean you should prefer that collection account on your credit report. No, because you the credit age is one thing. However, you want your credit report based on like positive reporting accounts, right? Um, and then, like I said, hard inquiries are anytime, you know, you are applying for an application and a company pulls your entire credit report, uh, that takes, like you, you'll you get a hard inquiry. That typically takes about like one to three points, um, give or take. Credit card inquiries do way more than installment inquiries. So that's pretty much like the most important thing you need to know about that. So when you are applying for an installment, let's say you're shopping for a home, all like the the just always remember you have a 14 day span time time span and as you can you can apply for as many home loans as you want within that 14 day period and your inquiries will be what's called deduplicated and that just means that you're not being dinged individually for every single inquiry this happens a lot with car loans so you know how you'll go to a car lot and then they'll pull your credit like 20 times a lot of people will freak out they're like oh my god they pull my credit so many times and did it they're not you're not being uh, you're not being negatively dinged for each individual inquiry when installment inquiries of the same type so auto loan installments or uh auto loan inquiries or like mortgage loans it, as long as you do them within the 14 day period you are only being affected by the amount of one now all of them will be on your credit report because they by law they have to report who who, who obtain access to your credit report, right? So they'll be within your credit increase. However, you are not being individually dinged for those. That's why uh, if you get, if you, you notice, you'll notice if you get um, increase deleted, you really won't gain many points. Like you, like I, like you'll get, you'll delete maybe like 10 inquiries and then you'll see, you'll notice like a two point difference, right? The point is increase are not going to make or break any single credit profile. And, um, yeah, I be paying too much attention to inquiries because that like I, I see a lot of people, they will literally avoid getting an inquiry. So they will prefer to not get an inquiry over building credit. So they will literally not apply for things like not not start not build credit. Out of the fear of getting a hard inquiry. And that's 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 super backwards, simply because, again, if you don't have a credit card and you worried about an inquiry, credit card by itself is worth 165 points and you worried about this small inquiry that's going to at max take three points you know so don't worry about inquiries when you are building when you are building your credit you are going to get inquiries within that first year of building your credit you're gonna have some inquiries get over it get over it inquiries ain't never stop nothing honestly if you if your credit profile is is truly set up right established and you're, and you're being a responsible borrower an inquiry or 12 or 16 will never stop you from obtaining quality credit. Never, never, never. All right. The only time inquiries affects you is if you don't, you don't got established credit. And that's the only thing on your credit profile. Like you, you don't have anything to, to, to um, level out the playing field in terms of like your positive reporting accounts. Nothing else on your credit profile is really aiding to giving you points. So like the little points that you did have, the inquiries are like affecting it, right? But if you establish your credit profile, I promise you. Now that don't mean go crazy. That does not mean go crazy because it, 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 there is a such thing as building credit too fast. And we'll talk about that. Um, And then the last category is your credit mix. Your credit mix is based on the account types that you have on your credit profile. So the variety of accounts, re uh, revolving credit lines, which are credit cards. I mean, revolving trade lines, which are credit cards, installment trade lines, which are loans, um, 
the types of installments are like short term, long term. And we'll get into that, like I said, in just a second. But this is this is showing that you have experience dealing with a variety um, of account types. Like you have you don't just have experience with auto loans. You your credit profile is not just based on you having one or two credit cards. Right. You you are showing that um, you're responsible with each type of credit. And that is the only way that you're going to maximize, like I said, your, your credit mix. OK. Now repairing your credit versus building your credit. There is a difference. There is a huge difference. And most people only focus on one, which is a grave mistake. Okay. Um, rebuilding or building and repairing credit are distinct paths. So th these are, those are two different things, two different things, re rebuilding or building um, and repairing. Those are two different avenues, two different avenues. While repairing credit, it addresses your past error. So the things that you've done in the past, the mistake, the credit mistakes that you've made in the past. That's the only thing that repairing your credit does because you are challenging old derogatory accounts or old late payments, old charge offs, old collections, right? That addresses your past credit errors. Rebuilding focuses, focuses on creating present. So your open accounts, your present financial stability and, a and you are creating a positive credit record to assist lenders in forecasting your future. Hear me when I say your lenders, your credit profile, your borrowing power, it is primarily based on the, the, the most recent 24 months of credit history. And whatever your lender, um, whatever your credit profile suggests that your, your future, like the forecast of your future financial conduct. And obviously the only way that they can uh, predict how your like your credit behaviors in the future is if they if is it is if they conduct it off what you're doing now and then the last 24 months of your credit profile. Okay. So the reason why I want to make that distinct difference is because there are so many people who spend lots of money, spend many years only focusing on repairing their credit. Only focusing on repairing their credit. All they're concerned with all they're concerned with um, is how do I get this collection deleted? How do I get this charge off deleted? How do I address these late payments? Oh my goodness, these student loans are da 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 da. And what you don't realize is, even in let's say best case scenario, you get every single derogatory account or every single negative account on your credit uh, report deleted, removed, whatever. You still have to build credit. Like having no derogatory accounts. Are, like having no negative accounts, no derogatory accounts, that is not synonymous with having good credit. And most people get that part confused. They are number one confused on why, as they are as they are repairing their credit and, and getting items deleted, why they're not seeing their credit score just skyrocket. That's number one. Number two, why they're not getting approved for the things that they're applying for. That's simply because the absence of derogatory accounts does not automatically mean that your credit profile is good. You're, you have a you have good credit, right? The only thing, only, the only thing that determines if you have good credit is if you are currently like actively establishing and building positive credit history. Okay. So again, if you have bad credit and you you know you have a past where you have collections, you have charge offs, you have late payments. It's two, it's two separate paths. Now you can work on both simultaneously. So like you can be repairing your credit if you want, um, at the same time as, as, you know, rebuilding your credit profile. However, you have to rebuild if you ever want to have good credit. In fact, I will go as far as to say, if you are repairing your credit without rebuilding, then you are wasting your money and you're wasting your time. Get your money back, baby. Cause it, there's nothing that's going to change. Like you, 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 we're going to be, we're going to be in the same, you're going to be in the same position 12 months from now, 24 months from now. Right. Another, another thing and another mistake that I, that I'm constantly seeing is people under the assumption that, you know, I'm not going to build credit until I repair my credit. Okay. Or I'm just going to wait seven years until these accounts fall off and then I'll start building credit. That is a mistake guys. <laughs> that is insane. Simply because all of that time that, that's passing, all of those months that's passing, you could be establishing credit. There is a such thing as building around bad credit, building around derogatory accounts. In fact, when you are repairing your credit, you're going to soon realize that it, it, 
the chances of you getting every single uh, negative account removed is very slim. You know, social media sells a, 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 a faltered image of what a, a true credit repair process is like. It sells a dream and they want your money. <laughs> They really just want your money. I'm, I'm, I'm really being for real. They just want your money. So they'll, they'll, they'll sell dreams and they'll say, I'll get everything deleted. I'll do a credit sweep. I'll do this and do that and do that. And baby, it's the reason why you're constantly repeating this same cycle every 24 months. Like hop off the, hop off the hamster wheel and like truly dedicate the time to focusing on your credit, whether that's you repairing it, but uh, specifically that you are building your credit. And like I said, even if you are paying someone to, to build to, to repair your credit, you should absolutely be building your credit yourself. No one else can build your credit for you. No one else. You can't pay anyone to build your credit. It's impossible because building credit is based off your primary accounts, based on the accounts that you get approved for in your name. You can't build your entire credit profile based on AU accounts, authorized user accounts, right? You have to build your own credit. If you are paying someone to repair your credit and you're not building your credit, you are wasting your money, including myself. If you ever sign up for any services that I have and you are not trying to build your credit, baby, keep your money. I, I keep it because you're wasting. You're really wasting your money. So don't do it. Don't like it's, it's, it's honestly it's like going around in a circle. It's really like you're on a hamster wheel if you think that you can repair without rebuilding your credit. Because honestly, you can you can you can rebuild without repairing technically. However, you cannot repair without rebuilding. That's the difference. Rebuilding and adding positive reporting accounts to your credit report, that's where you're going to get your points. That's where you're going to see the, the major difference in your credit profile. That's where you're going to actually start to, to, to see approvals and see your borrowing power increasing. That's when you're going to notice the difference. If you are only focused on repairing, I have news for you. You're wasting your time. You're just wasting your time. So don't do it. Like If you're going to repair, which... That and I'll talk about that next um, webinar, but because we're just focusing on building now. If you, when you repair, not if, not if, because if you have bad credit, there are ethical, legal ways that you should be repairing your credit. We'll talk about that later. However, you have you can't do so without building. You can't you 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 need to build. Don't allow time to pass where you could be building credit and adding payments to your 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 payment bank and um, establishing your credit. And, and you you just focus on like, you know, I'm not going to start building credit until, you know, my credit is good. No, don't do that. that like, that's insane. Don't do that. All right. So um, I don't feel like I just I really just talked through that. So we ain't got to talk about that. All right. So now the types of credit that are on your credit report. So when, when you are establishing credit and, and um, you know, getting the, the base level credit profile, there are four account types that you'll notice or you'll see or that you have an option to add to your credit profile. One is installment. Installment is just another word for loan. OK, so um, and then you have revolving credit, which is a credit card. Let me get a drink of water, child. It'll be saved on YouTube. OK. <clears throat> okay. So then so the four types of accounts that you can have on your credit report is installment credit, which are loans. It's installment is another word for loan. Um, a loan is a specific, I mean, an installment credit is a specific loan type that includes borrowing a set amount and includes a fixed monthly payment over a agreed amount upon duration, right? So whenever you get a loan, whenever you let's just say you're getting a car loan. You know before you even drive off the lot what your monthly payment is, how many payments that you have to make, you know, how long the contract is, and um how much you borrowed, because those don't change. Interest is added, but I meant like your monthly payment stays the same. The amount of time the account is open stays the same unless you get like a deferment or or unless you literally change the loan term or refinance, right? But that's a different loan. There is set specific amounts for a loan, right? A loan is, desi is designed to build your credit over time, right? So if you have a car loan or any installment type, what most people don't realize is loans, you are not really going to see a difference in your credit score, like your score, um, until that loan is at least 90% paid off, right? So that's why there are 
a lot of and, and like I said, you'll gain, you know, points here and there as you are paying the loan down, right? But the the bulk and the majority of the benefits of the loan of an installment account is um after you've paid off 90%, right? Because you are showing that you are like you agree to this long term and you can abide by the agreement. You you are you are a trusted borrower. So you are only going to see the biggest difference uh towards the end of the loan. However, that does not mean that you need to skip to the end. Because as I stated first, when, when it comes to your payment history, the more on-time payments that you have reported, the more points that you are getting within your payment history, right? Um, loans help with that. They help because you just build over time. Don't, don't be in a rush to uh, pay off installments as you are establishing your credit, okay? Because that's the only way you're going to start. How, how, how else are you going to establish credit? If you just, if you get a loan and you pay it off in, if you get a, a five-year loan and you pay it off in six months, kudos, I guess. However, that, that that does not help your credit, right? This is why whenever you pay off a loan, when most people pay off loans early, they'll, they'll see or they'll realize that they are losing points. Like their credit score decrease. I can't tell you how many times I hear, I just paid off my student loans or I just paid off my car loan. And to my surprise, my credit score went like it decreased. And I'm like, yeah, that's because whenever a loan hits your credit profile, basically your payment history or your the algorithm of your credit profile, it calculates how many payments it's expecting for this loan, right? So if you have a car loan that's uh, 72 months, whenever that installment hits your credit report, it has a term length, right, of 72 months. Your credit profile will grade you against how close you get to that install, uh, uh, how close you get to that completion of the loan. Okay. Now, there are going to be some times where you cannot control it. So, if you have a house, if you have a car and you are refinancing it, you're selling your home, you're selling your car, or you're getting a new car, you're trading it in, all of those things will cause you to end that installment early. All of those things that I just mentioned, those are just par for the course. Like, you just have to accept, okay, cool, I'm not going to get the full um, value out of this loan in terms of credit, but it made more sense due to interest or due to, you know, finances, right? Then that's okay. Where you can make up for that is short-term installments because there are two installment types. There are short-term and there are long-term. Long-term installments are installments with a term length over 36 months. Short-term installments are installments with a term length under 36 months. So when it comes to short-term installments, those are going to be the account types that you just allow to allow them to to age. Like just pay it, pay it as agreed and don't be in a rush to pay it off early because again, that's not doing anything for you because most long-term installments, they they will end early. Like most will. Um another thing that causes you to kind of lose a little credibil credibility on your installment accounts is deferred payments. Outside of student loans. So student loans don't count. <laughs> Everybody defer their student loans. That, that does not count against you. However, what most people don't realize is any other account type, any other installment type, too many deferments actually, um, you it, it decreases the value of the loan. So like I said, it has that term length whenever your, your installment reports. And if your term length is 72 months and it took you 84 months or whatever to pay it off, that's not a good thing. Because again, like I said, they're grading you against how close you come to the original loan term. How close you come to the original loan term, whether you end that early or end it after. It the closer you are to the original loan term is the the uh increasing the value of what that specific installment means to your credit profile, right? Um so outside like I said, outside of student loans. This is why you need to make sure that all of your student loans are like it says educational loan or student loan, because I've seen many times, countless times where student loans are just reporting as installments. They're just reporting as loans um, and they have multiple deferments. And that's actually horrible for your credit profile. So like if you ever do a credit application, like you, let's say you apply for credit and then you get the denial reason of um, it's worded different on each credit bureau, but it'll say something along the lines of um, not how do they word it? I'll just give you a roundabout and you'll be able to spot it. But it'll say something along the lines of 
you have not um the percentage of the percentage of the percentage of installment accounts not paid as agreed or something along those lines like it'll it'll say something along the lines of you 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 haven't paid enough on your credit uh on your installment accounts the only time you will see that error or not error that denial reason not the only time, but 99% of the time that people get that account, get that denial reason is because your one of your student loans are reporting as a regular loan. I see it often. I see it often. And that's one of the things that's that's just a reporting mistake, by the way. So like you literally all you have to do is is call, really. But I always send every I want everything in black and white with the credit bureau. So I suggest calling and sending a letter, but literally just requesting them to add the correct account type to that student loan. But just something as small as them not showing. So every every loan will show as an installment, right? However, under the account type, it should absolutely. You need to make sure that it says educational or student. Because if it does not, then understand that that installment is being graded, graded the same as any other installment, which student loans, it gives you, you get a lot of leeway with student loans. You get a lot of leeway, right? So just if you ever get the denial reason of the percentage of installment accounts not paid as agreed, that's what they usually say. The percentage of installment accounts not paid as agreed, that typically means that your student loan is reporting as a regular loan and not a student loan. That was a side note. <laughs> okay, so then the other account type that you're able to have on your credit report is a revolving credit, which, like I say, is a credit line. Um, a credit line with a set limit um it has a set limit and then it accumulates interest on any remaining balances so it's uh if you ever hear revolving credit i'm referring to a credit card um and then the other account type is a, is self-reported accounts what are self-reported accounts they're not as popular as they used to be but self-reported accounts are accounts that don't natively report to your credit report like the credit bureaus and you have to source like you have to go through a third-party source in order to get it reported so your rental payments uh have it has it i don't know if you guys have heard of like Experian go um uh rental clarna i think it's called rental clarma some stuff like that so like your rental payments your utility bills uh yeah and accounts like that those are considered self reported accounts uh those those accounts don't really do much to aid to your borrowing power like they'll be there you know they don't really do much though they don't really do much um because most lenders don't even like, they omit them. Like they don't even take them serious. They don't even take it into the calculation of what they are assigning as your credit profile. Just FYI. Those are like filler accounts. You don't need them. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your money because you do be having to pay those third-party companies to report it. Waste the money. Um, okay. And then the fourth account type that you can have on your credit report is our open um, credit accounts. So open credit accounts are basically charge cards so basically it's open credit accounts that offer a flexible credit limit so if you have an american express card um you you very well may have like a charge card most american express cards are charge cards so like the the gold card the platinum card those are both considered charge cards as opposed to credit cards because they don't have a set limit the most important thing that you need to know about those is um while it's all great to not have a credit limit you know understand that any balance that you carry over carry over on a charge card it is it is to your detriment even a dollar so if you have a uh, american express gold card no you don't have a set limit however you even carrying a dollar over past the statement date on those cards it looks horrible it looks horrible on your credit report because those cards are not for carrying a balance they're literally for cycle in the balance meaning like you are spending but paying it back within the same billing cycle that's it if you are if you are not used to uh you know paying off your entire credit bill you need to get a just a regular credit card get a regular credit card with a limit don't get a charge card thinking you know oh this is great and it's flexible and i can spend what i want no 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 you can't <laughs> no you can't it actually um you are actually um basically holding that balance whatever balance that you carry over on your charge card you you are holding that against all of your other credit cards so it affects your overall utilization and if you don't have enough credit limits on your on your clothes like revolving accounts to substantiate whatever uh, balance that you're you're uh, carrying over on your your charge card then your your utilization is exceedingly high for no reason like because there is no limit so they don't report a utilization however that balance that's reported does go against your utilization so if you have a charge card 
do not carry a balance. That's not the card for that. And also, not not to mention, you are being charged in enormous amount of interest on carrying over anything on a charge card. Like you are charged more interest on carrying over balances on a charge card than a regular credit card. Like people don't realize that the amount of interest that you pay carrying a balance on a charge card is astronomical. And credit card interest in general is already like high as hell. So don't, don't just don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. It doesn't, it makes you look bad. It makes you look as though you don't know how to properly manage credit. So don't do it. Especially if you are getting like in, in pursuit of getting a home loan. Oh my goodness. Can I just say this real quick? As you guys know, I work in the mortgage industry and I help and I like I aid people on getting to the closing table, like getting the last few points or whatever few points that they can grab on within their mortgage scores in order to qualify for a mortgage loan and closing, right? Do you guys know that the number one reason why most people can't close, like literally most people don't have enough points to close is usually because of those charge cards. And it's usually like the, the Amex Gold card or the Amex Platinum because people get those cards and they don't realize that they're not credit cards. Like we group them into credit cards, you know, however, they are charge cards. They're not credit cards. So when you are carrying, carrying a balance, when it comes to your mortgage score specifically, um, any balance on a charge card double as your credit limit. So hear what I'm saying. If you carry it $2 on over on your American Express Gold card and you are applying for a mortgage, understand that your mortgage score will view that card as a maxed out card. It shows a 100% utilization because whatever balance you report doubles as your limit on charge on charge cards when it comes to mortgage scoring specifically. So you will have a 100% maxed out card, meaning you losing about 20 plus mortgage points. That's a whole nother topic for a whole nother day. But I just had to notate that because please stop carrying a balance on those cars for numerous reasons. But like, especially if you are applying for a home or even a car, any installment, but specifically like a home. All right. So examples of installment credit would be examples of um, installment credits. Like I said, would be mortgages, auto loans, personal loans, student loans, furniture loans. All of those are loans. They're installments. Examples of revolving credit would be credit cards, home equity lines of credit or HELOCs, um, personal lines of credit and like retail cards. Examples of self-reported accounts, like I said, would be rent payments, utility bills, cell phone bills, Experian Go. Um, and then example of open credit accounts would be like charge cards. OK, so. The question is, is your credit profile addressing every scoring category? Like is your credit profile set up properly? Are you currently maximizing the most amount of points that you could obtain regardless of whatever else is on your credit profile? This is this is the most important slide pretty much in this entire um, credit in, in this entire presentation. So everybody like screenshot this. This is the most important part. The reason being is because if you have bad credit and when whenever I reference bad credit, I'm referring to you have bad derogatory accounts on like actively on your credit report. If you have bad credit. You still need to have these, you still need to be hitting these marks, these this checklist, because even if you have bad accounts, you are able to technically build around bad accounts. You're able to build around bad accounts. So even if you have bad credit, if you have no credit or you have already established credit, you still need to be making sure that every one of these boxes are checked off. And until every one of these boxes are checked off, understand that you are missing out on like a lot of points for no reason. And it's a very, it's a very straightforward list. It's very attainable. And honestly, you can, you can, you can hit every mark on this list within at the most a thousand dollars, but really you can hit it within like $600 and I'll explain. So the number one thing that everyone needs to have for every, regardless of what credit score you have, every credit profile, every person that is serious about building credit, you need to have at least four accounts. That's just minimum. That that's just the bottom line. You have to have at least four accounts. Why? Simply because anything less than four accounts, your credit profile is considered thin. It does not matter how good your credit score is. It does not matter how great you're doing with the accounts that you have. If you have less than four accounts, you will never, you will never be qualified for any top offer simply because you have a thin credit profile. So you could, you could be a, an amazing person. You could, you could, you, you could have exemplified a, an amazing track record with the three accounts you have. Until you hit at least four, 
your credit profile is thin. I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. However, I do follow them, okay? So unless you have four accounts, thin credit profile, you're never gonna be taken like serious in, in a sense of getting top offers. It just is what it is. By the way, primary accounts. I should have I should have freaking bolded or whatever primary. I am only referring to primary accounts. So if you have authorized user accounts, they are not counted towards the list that I am giving you. That you can have them in addition to, you know, that's your business. However, if you have two authorized user accounts and then two primary accounts, no, 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 no. This entire list is referring to primary accounts. Primary accounts. Primary accounts are accounts that are in your name. You are approved for. I, I'm also not talking about co-owned accounts because that's another mistake that I see, especially within the mortgage industry, because you deal with a lot of like married couples. One of the the the, the things that I see often are when it comes to, to married couples, one person will be the account owner and then one person would either be the co-owner or an authorized user on all of the other accounts. Don't do that. Every single person, I don't care if you've been married for 20 years, y'all still have your own separate credit profile. So you have to build your own separate credit. I, it does not matter how long you've been married to anyone, y'all still have your own credit profiles, period. Now, can you guys be co-joined on certain accounts? Yeah, sure, cool. Have fun. However, at the minimal, every person, each person needs to have at least four open accounts, primary, okay? Now, what four open accounts should I get, Shonda? I got you. Two of the four accounts should be credit cards. So if you only have one credit card account, if you only have one credit card on your credit profile, um, you are, you, you're you never going to get, the, again, the top offers in a credit card because you can only exemplify so much with one credit card. I'm sorry. However, if you are just starting to build credit and you want to kind of get get used to using a credit card and kind of understand what it is, Nothing wrong with starting off with one if you're a young adult, if it's your child. Nothing wrong with starting them off with one credit card. Nothing. However, if in, if you want to uh, build credit in the most efficient way possible, two credit cards will help you build credit faster. Like it'll it'll help your credit score grow faster. OK, so you, you need four at least four accounts. Two of the four accounts needs to be credit cards. Primary, meaning in your name. Also, also, there's another caveat to that. Of these two credit cards, at least one of them needs to be an open bank card. So it it need it is it, it you shouldn't have just two retail cards like a, a Walmart card and a Victoria's Secret card. No, one of them, at least one of them, needs to have either a Discover logo, a Mastercard logo, American Express logo. What I'm missing? A Visa logo. Meaning you can use that card anywhere. It's not tied to just one institution. Do you can't like two retail accounts is the same as one card, guys. Um, you need to have at least one open bank card. It's really gonna be best if you have two the, the, the two credit cards, it's really best to have open bank cards. But if you're like me and many others, you know, when you first start building credit, the first type of credit account that you you know we start getting approved for is like retail cards. So we get excited and we start applying and da 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 da. You don't even need retail cards, guys. Please stay away from them from them if you have not already gotten them. I promise you they are trash credit cards. They're like, they don't, they're not doing you any justice. It's pointless. Like save yourself, save yourself the headache, the time, because those cards are trash. Like, honestly, they're trash. And there is going to be a day that you're going to wish that you didn't have that card. Trust me. Speaking from experience. <laughs> um. So if you could get two bank, open bank cards, that's, that's perfect. However, if you have one retail card, Make sure that you have, you know, that one open bank card. Okay, so that's two accounts. What's the re what's the last two? The third account get a short term installment. A short term installment is in any loan under thirty six months. Okay, so I'll give you examples of short term installments on the next slide. I think. Um, and then the final account get a long term installment. So if you have student loans, if you have an auto loan, if you have a mortgage account, um, you already have a, a long term installment. So so you're good on that. You don't have to to uh, meet that at, at this point, at this time. So one note that I would like to say is if you do not have a long term installment, that is the one account type 
that I will not recommend that you rush into. So don't get, don't just get a long-term installment for the sake of building credit. Because that's a long, like there's a long-term installment. There, there's real interest that come with that. And also it's long term. So this is something that you're going to have to put up with for years, for three plus years. So don't ever just get a long-term installment for the sake of just meeting this threshold because you can technically get two short-term installments. You don't have to get a long-term installment. Will it help you? But will it help you a little bit more? Yeah, but the difference is only about like 10 points. Not worth it. So if you are not in a market of getting a car, if you don't have student loans or whatever the case, don't get a long-term installment just because you, because you could do the same without and you won't notice the difference, I promise. However, if you already have a long-term installment, like a student loan, like a, uh, like I said, mortgage or auto loan or something like that, then you're good. You are, you've already, you know, checked off that on the list. Okay. So then the, the, the fifth, um, item on the checklist is a reported utilization between one and 9%. We are going to go over in detail how to properly pay a credit card in the next, like, I think like two slides. That's going to make sense then. But a, a consistently reported utilization between 1% and 9%. Reported utilization. Remember that. Reported utilization. And then the last item that I would recommend, and this is just a bonus, honestly. Um, and this is this is for the people who want to um, accelerate like their, their rebuilding process. Of your short, like if you have a short-term installment, Paying off 90% of it or any installment, paying off 90% of it and, and leaving the remaining 10% to, to you know, play out as, as according to the long term, that's going to give you a, 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 a little bit more boost in your credit profile as you are building. This, this That one, the last one is optional. That's mainly for my people who are trying to, like, get a home loan within the next, like, year. Um or like a car, like if you know you're getting a car loan within the next year, that's just something easily that you can do, that you're able to do, that'll, uh, like I said, accelerate your building process and kind of, you know, give you a, a, a boost, a small boost before you apply for, you know, whatever you're applying for, okay? Um, again, screenshot this. I'm going to repeat it one more time. So four open accounts, two of which being credit cards, one long-term installment, and then one short-term installment. And utilization, my bad, because somebody called me. And utilization, I'm going to repeat, I'm my bad, y'all. Let me repeat it because somebody just called. So again, so going, running down the list of the basic level credit profile that every person, if you are trying to, if you're serious about your credit, the basic level or the basic accounts that you need to have on every credit profile is at least four open accounts, two of which being credit cards. One long-term installment, one short-term installment. And the credit cards that you do have have a consistent reported utilization between one and nine percent. That's like bare minimum. Meaning if you have if you just have that, if you just have this list that I just named or I just uh listed out, if you only have that, you are able to obtain over a 730 credit score over time, over the course of two years. Over the course of two years. Um, and it may come faster depending on like if you don't have any derogatory accounts. If you have derogatory accounts and you have the this uh, credit profile, you can still obtain at least a 700. I think it was 12 when I did the calculate. So I'll just say like you you can at least, at least obtain a 700 credit score at the bare minimum by just by just literally making sure that your credit profile mirrors at least this, right? And then one more thing: after you get this, after you get your four accounts. Do not apply for anything else for at least a year if you are in the beginning stages of building your credit. Having, don't apply for anything for at least a year. There is a thing, there's a there is a such thing as building credit too fast. Um, it there is a such thing as building credit too fast. If your credit is not established, if you are just starting to build credit, the worst thing you could do is just apply for any account that'll approve you. Um, or the worst thing you could do is op open up, let's say like four, uh, four credit card accounts in one year. That's not a good thing, guys. Lender that like, that's a red flag to lenders. When they see that, they look, they looking like, whoa, dang, like this person is, is really, we need to make, first of all, here's what you need to know about lenders. There are multiple things that they don't like, but when it comes to your credit profile, what they don't like is too many new accounts. 
That's a red flag simply because they need to see that you are able to properly manage your current credit obligations before they are comfortable with lending you credit. And even if they do lend you credit, it's going to be at a reduced amount than what you would have likely qualified for had you allowed your credit accounts to age. Building credit too fast is going to keep you, that also keeps you stagnant, number one, but it, it, it for dang sure keeps you under a certain borrowing power. Like you ain't, you not, you ain't going to get, you, you're not going to get like really high credit limit. Cause again, that's a red flag and, and no responsible borrower is, or, or has the need to open up five credit cards in a single year. That's insane to lenders guys. Like that's insane. It's really insane to them. So after you establish these accounts, this should be the only year in your credit history that you have, I'll say, at most 10 inquiries, right? That should be the only account. I mean, that should be the only, this This should be the, the outside of like applying for a mortgage and comparing rates, applying for, you know, things and comparing rates. This should be the, the, the most active year for your inquiries when you are initially establishing credit. Because after you've established your, your, your base level profile, you you should only do installments number one when you know you're gonna get approved because then after you establish credit, like I said, you ain't really you you ain't gotta worry about denial. I ain't <laughs> never I was gonna say I'm just saying since I've started establishing credit, and a lot of credit cousins can attest to this for themselves as well, because it's not a brag, it's really just how our your credit scores are, are made up. I don't remember the last time I got denied. I don't remember the last time. In fact, if I get denied, I'm I'm I'll be shocked. I'll be more shocked than ever, simply because I I know and I understand the algorithm. I understand how like I understand the credit scoring algorithm. So you setting up your credit profile to a to the algorithm, you setting up your credit profile to a towards the algorithm. Algorithm, you're not going to have to worry about getting denials. And another thing that you're not going to have to worry about is what credit bureau is so-and-so going to pull? I see people do that all the time. They're like, what credit bureau are they pulling? The second I heard that question, I already know that your credit profile is not set up properly. Because let me tell you one thing about a great credit profile. A great credit profile translates across any credit score. Any. It translates around any credit score. It doesn't matter the differences in points between TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax, simply because your borrowing power is not based on your credit score. It's based on your credit profile. So it does not matter. I don't care if American Express decides today to pull TransUnion and then tomorrow to pull Experian. Most uh, of the top companies will even do a double pull anyway, but they'll pull two, two uh, bureaus, right? You don't got to worry about that if you set up your credit profile correctly, because like I said, a great credit profile will translate regardless of like it'll translate across any score scoring variation. So you don't got to worry about that. Like y'all be stressing yourselves out building credit spending all this money, getting all these cards, getting all these accounts for nothing. I just named four accounts. You literally can get a 700 plus credit score based on just four accounts, even with derogatory accounts. Even with derogatory accounts, I'm telling you, you just have to make sure that you are consistent. Consistent is a big word as it pertains to your credit profile, because one thing that everyone needs to know is nothing, absolutely nothing that you do on your credit profile is considered consistent until you've done it for 12 months. And with most companies, it's really, it, it, it gets really up to 18 months. But on average, nothing is considered your normal or your regular or consistent until you have done it for 12 months. Why do I say that? Because if you think that you're going to do this and then in two months or in 30 days, your credit score is going to hit 700 and you're going to have access to all these different offers. I'm sorry I've wasted your time up until this point because that's not how credit works. That's not how credit works. Even if your credit score goes up and increases, don't get so excited and start applying for all these different accounts. Allow your credit score to grow. You have to establish your credit profile. Um, I tell people all the time, if you just dedicate a good 24 months, so for the from now and for the next 24 months, if you really just dedicate to your credit profile, making sure that you are not getting any late payments, even if you've had a history of late payments. That happened in the past, let that go. Focus on your current, your active accounts, your open accounts, and then your future. Not getting any late payments for the next 24 months. Making sure you don't get any new collections, any new charge-offs. Um, making for dang sure that your utilization is consistently being reported as between 1% to 9%. There is no reason why 
in within the next 24 months and you'll you'll likely hit this before but i always like to give 24 months to give a you know a little wiggle room and on average you are going to not only be like you're going to be so thankful that you you know of course followed and abided by you know this list also your borrowing power you're going to see a big difference in applications in the things that you qualify for and how easy life gets once you are able to get the benefits of having good credit like but until you put in that put in that put in that time which is two years you you cannot expect anything you really can't expect nothing stop stop um trying to you know take the shortcut stop trying to do some do one small thing expecting huge results you reap what you sow so expect the harvest of every of the seeds that you've sown so don't think that seven years of bad credit history is going to be erased or or undone based on three months of of good credit history that's not how credit works not how life works in general but that's not how credit works so on, when um even if you have like i said bad credit there is a way to build around bad credit you just it's time it's time a lot of times credit scores are stagnant simply because people don't allow their credit scores to age they don't understand the value of an aging credit report, right? Um, every account that you have on your credit profile, every three months, it graduates to the next age, right? So an account that is under three months old, that's considered, it's like an infant, right? And then three to six months, you're going to see a little boost in, in points, maybe like a few points, because that account has graduated to the next tier. An account is considered new until it has reached 18 months, period. So if you are doing a credit card application and one of your denial reasons is too many new accounts, understand that you have an account or two or three, you have multiple accounts on your credit report that is under 18 months old. After an account reaches 18 months, you no longer will get that, that rating or that reason because an account that is older than 18 months is no longer considered new. But even if an account is 17 months, it will it will be tagged with the new account and that's just this is an automatic thing right it'll be tagged with a new account until it surpasses 18 months so if like i said you are applying for a credit card and and that's one of the top three denial reasons is you have too many new accounts don't apply for anything else until your oldest account i mean i'm sorry don't apply for anything else until your newest account has reached at least 18 months because then you are not tied to the new account rating okay um also, a recent, uh, another uh, very popular like denial reason is too many recent derogatory accounts or too many recent late payments. Recent, in terms of your credit report and credit applications, means it occurred in the last 24 months. Recent. So they say you have too many recent derogatory accounts or the presence of derogatory accounts. That just means that within the last 24 months, you either had a new collection, you either uh, an account went from you know, open to charged off, or you've had a late payment. That means that something occurred negatively on your credit profile within the last 24 months. After you reach to the after you reach the point where you are 24 months free of any derogatory activity, contingent on the fact that you are also building, because that's important, then you really yes, the uh negative accounts does affect you, you know, in in a little bit. However, it like the older a negative account is or a derogatory a derogatory event is the less impact that it has on your credit score and also your borrowing power so anything outside of 24 months you need to be hitting a recon line like hey i guess i have these two charge offs however they were two years old at the time da -da 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 -da. and we'll talk about that in a second but you have a you have way more like wiggle room when when they're um when 24 months has has passed okay um all right so now Let's talk about paying your credit card. Hey, if you're on you, if you're on TikTok and if you're on Instagram, you might want to uh, come over to YouTube because we're going to talk about how to properly pay a credit card. Or maybe maybe y'all ain't visual learners and y'all can just hear it and and, and follow. Um, but let's talk about this is my favorite topic. Y'all, credit cards in general are my favorite topic, but I have a specific like passion about paying your credit card properly or even just utilizing a credit card properly only because it's done wrong like 90% of the time. Okay. So let's talk paying your credit card bill correctly. Hold on. I got to get a, I got to, I got to get a drink of water for this. Put a one in the comment. If you feel like you already know how to pay your credit card. 
or put a two if you feel like oh, I'm not really sure. I need to I need to probably like double check some things. She ain't lying. I had five negative accounts on my report, and my score was six eighty. I will I, listen. I might tell you a joke, but I promise I would never lie to you. I promise. You can re anything I ever mention, reference it. Like go research it. I promise you. I'm gonna tell you a joke though, but I won't ever lie to you. Okay. A one, 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 two. Okay. All right. Let's talk about this. So, how to properly pay your credit card. A lot of y'all be paying y'all credit cards wrong and y'all stress me out because building credit is great. Doing great by your credit cards is amazing. However, if you're not properly paying your credit card, then all of that hard work that you're doing means nothing because what it is not, it, Nothing matters in terms of credit unless you can prove it in black and white. Unless your credit report speaks to the same thing, it doesn't matter. Your intentions, it doesn't matter how great of a person you is. Your credit score and your credit profile, I mean, your credit profile needs to be able to speak for you when you're not in the room. So it is very specific on how you pay your credit card bill, okay? All right, let's start. First, the, the, the first thing that everyone needs to understand there are two distinct dates that every person needs to know when it comes to credit cards. Every single credit card, every person, I don't care how long you've had that credit card, I don't, it doesn't matter. Every single credit card has two very important dates and you need to be aware of both. So the first date that everyone needs to be aware of is your due date. Most people are aware of their due date. That's not really, that's not usually the issue, right? What's important about your due date, your due date is the deadline by which you must make at least your minimum payment that or at least your minimum payment on your credit card balance to avoid any late fees and potential potential damage to your credit uh score right so your bank will let you know they're gonna dang show let you know when your due date is they'll let you know when your due date and then they'll say hey the minimum payment that we'll accept as an on-time payment is 25 dollars so as long as you pay this 25 dollars by this date then you, we won't consider you late. It doesn't matter how how much of a how large your balance is, as long as you hit at least the minimum payment, then you will not get a late. They will not charge you a late fee, nor will you get a late payment on your credit report. That's the most important thing about your due date, right? Now, another important thing about your due date is your bank. They cannot report to the credit bureaus that you are late until you have surpassed 30 days past your due date. So if let's just say your due date is, let's say our due date on, on our fictional credit card is the 15th of the month and your minimum payment is $25. If you pay $24.99, guess what? You're, you're considered late. You can't even You can't even be a cent off. You have to meet at least the minimum payment or you are considered late. So that means that your bank can legally charge you late fees on, on, on your account, right? However, if your due date is on the 15th and um, you, make, you make that $25 payment or more, or more, heavy on it or more, then you're good in terms of having a late payment reported or late fees, but it, you're, you're not done. That's just the first part. Right. So your due date is crucial for on time payments. That's the only your due date is what determines if a payment is late or not. Missing payments can significantly lower your credit score. And I know I told you guys that they cannot report you to the credit bureaus as late until you are 30 days past due. Understand that even if you are a day past your due date, the relationship that you have with your bank does matter as well. That matters for like future credit limit increases and things of that nature. So you only caring about like what the credit uh report the credit bureau's report you are jeopardizing a relationship that you have with your bank so even if you pay two weeks late or or two days late your bank charges you a late fee that ruins the relationship with them so when you look into get more money or more things from them they may very well you know deny you so keep the, just keep that in mind although it does not affect your credit score until you until you are at least 30 days late it does affect the relationship that you have with your bank and understand the credit bureaus are not the ones that's lending you money they, they they ain't coming off the money. Your lender is. So that relationship between you and your lender is is extremely important. Okay. Um, and then also 
paying the minimum payment by your due date will keep your account current, like I said, but you will still accrue interest on charges that you carry over. So we have a $200 credit card. Your balance at the time of your credit card statement was, we just gonna say $200 for easy math tracking purposes, right? So you, you, you fully utilize your entire credit limit. Your minimum payment is only $25. You choosing to pay your minimum payment will bring your balance to $175, right? So you pay $25. However, the remaining balance is $125, $175. You are going to be charged, though your bank can't charge you a late fee, they will charge you interest on, on, on the remaining $175. So this is where a lot of people will, you know, get into credit card debt and then find themselves in a hole that is almost impossible to climb out of. Because credit card interest is, is so extremely high at this point, because it does um, fall in line with the Federal Reserve rate. So anytime you hear about the Federal Reserve rates increasing, know that your credit card uh, interest rates are also increasing. OK. Um, and right now, credit card interest is the highest that is that it's ever been since the like since credit cards were established, like literally. So say all that to say. Yeah, you can technically pay the minimum payment to avoid late payments. However, it's not recommended because you are going to pay a lot of interest. And like I said, it doesn't really do much to better the relationship between you and your bank. OK, so due date. Everyone knows what their due date is. OK, cool. Now. The next important date that is equally as important as your due date is your statement date. This is the date that many people just skip over, but this date is so important. It is so important. In fact, it's the most important date as it pertains to your credit score. Why? Simply because your statement date is the date that your credit card issuer, so your bank, so the date that your bank ends your current billing cycle and they generate what's called a monthly statement. By law, by the credit card act, uh, by the credit card act of two, 2009, by law, every bank has to send a credit card statement every single month. So you need, if you have a credit card, you have to get a credit card statement every month. You can choose to get it via email or uh, in the mail. However, your bank has to issue a credit card statement every single month. Okay, your statement date is when this credit card statement is generated. Remember that. Follow me because I want to I want to make sure that everyone knows how to pay their credit cards. So your statement date marks the ending of your billing cycle and also generates a monthly statement. So if your if your statement date, let's say our statement date is on the 30th of the month. On the 30th of the month, the current billing cycle that you're in will end. Not only that, your your bank will generate a monthly statement and they'll send it two places. One, they'll send it to you. They'll say, here's your credit card statement. Your credit card statement will include your due date, your, your minimum payment, the interest that you were charged and all of that, right? The second place that they send it is what's important. They send your credit card statement minus the detailed transactions information. They send your credit card statement to the credit bureaus. They send your credit card statement to the credit, your monthly statement to the credit bureaus. Like I said, they don't they don't have like they, the credit bureaus are not privy to like your 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 transactions. However, they do see, um, you know, I'll get to that in a minute, whatever. So they send a credit card statement to you and then they send one to the credit bureaus. Why is that important? Your utilization is based off your statement balance. It's based off whatever balance that you had at on your statement date. It's not based off your due date. So if our if our due date is on the 15th of the month and then our statement date is not until the 30th of the month. Even if you paid off your entire balance by your due date, but you occurred uh, more charges between the 15th and the 30th, your due date and the statement date, whatever balance is present, whatever your current balance is present on your statement date, that is what is what that's what's being sent to the credit bureaus. That's called your statement balance. Your utilization is based off your statement balance. Everyone who has a credit card, do me a favor and go look at your most recent credit card statement. You will have two different balances. You will have a current balance and then you will have a statement balance. Your statement balance was what your utilization was based off the last month because we're billed retroactively. So obviously, um, if you get a credit card statement today, that means that like you're paying for the charges that happened last month, right? Um because after a statement ends, they'll issue you a statement. So you're looking at the, the things that you did last month, okay? So if you look at your most recent credit card statement, it'll have a statement balance. 
That's what was sent to the credit bureaus. Your statement balance is held against whatever your credit limit is. So if your statement balance was $100 and then your credit limit was $200, then your utilization is going to be 50%. The credit bureaus base your utilization off your report, the, the credit bureaus base your utilization off your reported statement balance. This is why it is a distinct difference between usage and utilization, meaning regardless of how often you use your credit card, how much of your credit limit that you use throughout the month, even if you exceed 30% of your credit card throughout the month, that does not matter. The credit bureaus are not privy to that. They don't care. What they care about is how much you carried over. So once that billing cycle ended, the 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 amount of outstanding the the amount of outstanding credit limit or or the amount of of, of outstanding charges that remain past your statement date is what you're graded off of so it's not it's not uh how often you use your credit report you don't have to restrict yourself to only using 10 percent or 30 percent of your credit card what you do have to do is ensure that by by the time that your statement date comes Whatever you've done, however much you spend, as long as you ain't exceed the balance, obviously, but however much you spent, as long as you ensure that you are reducing your, your balance to under 90 or to under 10% of whatever the limit is, then you're good. So basically make a habit of spending on your credit card, but paying it off within the same cycle. The things that you do, the things that happen within the same cycle is none of the credit bureau's business. It's none of the credit bureaus business. They don't care. They, they're, like, they're not privy to the information. The only thing that they care about and are privy to is, however, what, what you left over past that date. So once that, once that statement or billing cycle closes, anything that you have left remaining on that credit card, that's what the credit bureaus are aware of. Let's say we had a $200 credit card and... By our due date, um, like I said, we 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 just gonna say we maxed out our card. So we have a two hundred dollar credit card. You get your credit card statement in the mail. Your bank says your balance is two hundred dollars, but the minimum payment that we'll accept is twenty five dollars. Our due date is on the fifteenth of the month, and then our statement date is on on the thirtieth because your statement date is always going to be after your your due date. By the way, so they say, hey, we'll accept twenty five dollars as an on time payment. Let's just say you paid $25. Okay, cool. That's your choice. You could do that. You could pay $25 and then now you have a remaining balance of $175. As long, technically, as long as come, as long as by the 30th of the month, you pay off. What's what's the math? You pay off at least $155 more. So meaning like your balance is below $20 come your statement date then you good. It, it really, it honestly does not even matter that you only pay your minimum by your due date. You're going to pay a little more interest. However, in terms of your credit report, your credit score, that it doesn't matter because they don't know about that. They don't care about that. All they care about is the balance that you carry over past your, past your statement date. That's all they care about. Another important thing to know is, um, now, like I said, on your statement date, it marks the ending of that billing cycle. So it closes it off to any future charges or any future transactions. So any, any charges that occur on this credit card. So if our statement date is on the 30th and um, any pending charges or pending transactions, it will automatically go to your next cycle. So it, no pending charges or payments will post on your statement. Once it closes, it closes. Anything that's pending, it'll go on your next cycle. It's, that's important to know because Whenever you are trying to make sure that you pay in time for your statement date, make sure you are making like your payments or reducing your balance to under 10% of your limit at least 48 hours before your statement date. Reason being is because most banks will process payments for like one to two days. Most banks take takes about uh, one to two days, business days to process payments. So if you are making a payment on our, our, our statement date is the 30th. Let's say you made a payment on the 29th but it's a weekend or you know whatever it, it, it's a normal day however your bank does not process that payment for another 48 hours then unfortunately it does not count towards this it doesn't count towards this cycle you'll be credited for next cycle however you got to still make sure that your balance is is 
below 10% come your next statement date. So make sure, make a habit of, of reducing your balance to under 10% at least 48 hours before your statement date. That is so important. Now, um, key points about your statement date, like I said, it does impact your credit utilization ratio. Your utilization, your reported utilization is based on a balance, is based on your statement balance. If you look at your most recent credit card statement, you will see a statement balance. And then you'll get a, a clearer picture on, oh, okay, that's why, regardless of how much I pay on my due date or how many times I make, uh, I'm, I'm paying off this credit card throughout the month, that's why my utilization is not decreasing. Like my utilization is not going down. I get that all the time. I'm constantly paying my credit card, but why am I, why is my credit score not going up? Why, why is my utilization still being reported as high? Well, it's simply because whatever your balance was on your statement date, you didn't make sure that you on your statement date, your balance was reflective of whatever you wanted your utilization to be. Okay. So your utilization only matters one day a month. You got, you have one day a month that you need to be militant about your balance. And that is on your statement date. That's really the only thing outside of your statement date. You can use your credit card. It's a fallacy to think that you can only use 30% of your credit card. No. However, you should not be carrying over. Right. Like, cause you know, every, everyone always say like, if you look, I'm, I'm talking, you don't, I don't care where you're learning this from. If you look on any site or whatever, it'll always say, only use, only restrict usage to 30% of your credit cards. No, that's not how credit card works. No. However, you shouldn't care. It, 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 all that matters is what you carry over. Okay. So you don't have to do the, what's the, what's the one thing like the five and third, three rule or some 15, whatever. It's like different like things that I see on TikTok. You ain't got to, don't stress yourself out. You don't have to worry about none of that. I'm telling you now, the only thing that you need to make sure of is by your due date, this is at minimum. So I'm going to give two scenarios. By your due date, you need to pay at least your minimum payment just so you can avoid late fees, late payments. Come your statement date. I don't care what your balance is. I don't care how much of your credit card you've spent. I don't care if you use 100% of your credit limit. Come your statement date, just make sure that your balance is below 10%. And then don't touch your credit card until your statement date passes. Because what you don't want is a transaction to accidentally post. Some transactions post immediately. Like when you get gas, most of the times they'll post immediately. Or, you know, like different, 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 like Amazon, they'll post immediately. So you want to make sure that I basically like my cars are locked up. 48 hours a month, each car. So it's the, the, the 48 hours before my statement date. Come 12 o'clock after your statement date, you good. The, it's a whole new cycle. So now you at the beginning of your next cycle. So it, it, it rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, okay? Um, Like I said, look at your pre most recent credit card statement and it'll give you a great, idea. it'll give you a good idea on, on your utilization and why it's not decreasing. And that's simply because you are not cognizant of the balance that is re being reported on your statement date. For every one of my credit cards, I have a, a, a um, alert, a, um reminder set up in my phone for when the statement date is. Because not for nothing, I don't, I don't really care about my due date simply because I'm constantly making payments on my credit card. So in any billing cycle, I, of course, would have would have already met the minimum payment, right? Like, so I don't even worry about my due date. The date that I am concerned about is my statement date because that's the date that's going to to matter. Like that's the date that it affects my credit score. So that's the only day of the month that I even am again cognizant of my balance. I, like I don't, I don't, I don't really trip on my balance any other days of the month because I'm constantly like spending and making and making payments, spending and making payments. I just make a habit of that because I live off my credit cards. I'm a, I'm a, I'm an avid credit card user. So. Um, cause there is not a time that I'm ever going to choose using my debit card over my credit card ever. You shouldn't either. However, first get a credit card and learn, you know, how to probably spend on it before you make this change. Because, you know, if you do, if you do it wrong, you can get in credit card debt, which I don't want you guys to do. But, um, for me, I'm an avid credit card user. There isn't a single instance where I'm ever going to prefer my debit card over my credit card ever, unless I have to, like, if I need cash, then I'll use my like debit card. Um, to pay my mortgage, well, you got to use your bank account. But anything that I could pay my credit card with, I'm paying it with because I want I, I want my reward. I want a point for everything. I don't care. I want to be rewarded every single time I swipe. Absolutely. I don't care if I'm getting a bag of chips. I don't care. I need the reward points. I need the reward points because I like flying for free. I like traveling for free. Therefore, it, my entire life is going to be based on my credit cards. However, 
I'm going to ensure that I, I, so I'm never spending anything that I cannot cover within the same billing cycle. That's another key point. If you kind of, if, if you change the way that you view credit cards and literally just view it as a replacement of your bank account. So basically if it's not in your bank account or won't be in your bank account within the next 14 days, then you don't have, you don't have it. I don't care what your credit score is. When you are building credit, no. When you are building credit, really, really be militant about your credit cards because that really can make or break your, your, your credit building process. And that can hold you and keep you stagnant and hold you to a certain level of, 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 of credit limits if you are like really approaching it like okay rule number one if you have chip like if you have young adults please teach them this rule number one i'm not swiping this credit card for anything that i can't go in my bank account and get within the next 14 days period if i if i can't afford it in my bank account like if i can't cover that charge within the next 14 days then i don't need it i can't afford it okay unless it's like do or die unless it's like an emergency then okay cool However, for the most part, all of your expenses don't like don't be swiping for nothing that you're not willing to cover within the same billing cycle because you're going to pay interest on that. So you're going to pay more for whatever you just bought and it's not helping your credit score. So what's the point? You might as well just spend on your debit card. Like don't don't get in credit card debt and then, you know, be like super stressed out about that debt continuing to increase and grow. And then now you're in a hole that is like, like I said, like nearly impossible to get out of. Save yourself the headache. If you cannot cover it within the next 14 days or at most 30, so basically within the same billing cycle, if you know you ain't you ain't you ain't getting any money to cover this, then you don't need to purchase it on your credit card. Especially in the beginning of establishing credit. You like, especially if you have a low limit credit card, you really need to be militant about that. I always say, like when you are first establishing credit, you are on probation. You are on credit probation. No, you cannot do what every what you see everybody else doing. No, you you not gonna um, have thousands and thousands of points and flying all around the world for free. No, you don't have the same leverage and leeway as, as the people who have established credit because they had to go through that that rough two year process too. The first two years of you getting a credit card, you are on probation. You're on probation. You're not carrying over ten uh, percent of the limit past the statement date. No. You're not purchasing anything that you cannot cover within the same billing cycle. No, you really have to be militant within that first two years. And I promise you it's going to pay off because being militant with a $500 credit card, with a $1,000 credit card, with a $1,500 credit card is a lot easier than learning how to use a credit card after you get a $20,000 credit card. I promise you, you, you want to make your mistakes and learn on a on a $1,500 credit card, on a $500 credit card, on a $200 credit card. Don't wait to $20,000 to correct your, your financial habits. And if, you know, this is you and it's, it's already too late, it's okay. You, you know now. However, if you, if you haven't, you know, gotten like a high limit credit card yet, start practicing great financial habits with a $200 credit card. Because newsflash, more money does not mean that you have more disposable income. There's a lot of people that make a lot of money that are still broke because they don't have healthy financial habits. And it's just it just is what it is. Like you have like you don't just learn financial habits as you get access to more money. Actually, the quite opposite, like the opposite happens. You 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 typically um, if you don't already have great healthy financial habits, then you're more likely to end up in a in, in, you know, filing bankruptcy or end up in credit card debt. It just is just how it goes because you have more at your, like you have more at your disposal, you know? So if you cannot manage a $500 credit card, why is you applying for a $10,000 credit card? Why? Like be so serious. Why? You, you the one got to pay that back or you like, you are the one that is going to be affected by that. Like credit is real. It sticks with you. You could be so like, please guys, <laughs> like for real, we really just got to number one, look in the mirror. Cause it's like, We'll blame everybody else for why we got bad credit. And this is coming from someone who had bad credit. I had bad credit as well. So I'm not speaking from a mountaintop. I'm speaking face, like I'm telling you, like I'm like you, we all have went through bad credit. The first thing to repairing and rebuilding your credit is accepting the fact that I messed up. It was me. I'm the reason why I have these 12 collections. I'm the reason why I have this repossession. I'm the reason why I have this charge off. Be real with yourself. If you are not real with yourself, you're going to be back here in 24 in, in, in a year, right? First of all, under note like identify all of your bad financial habits. Okay, 
I got a problem with spending too much on my credit card. So I should, I'm, maybe this time I shouldn't get a retail card because retail cards, even statistically, it shows that obviously you're going to shop more, do more unnecessary shopping with a retail card. Cause babe, there is not an emergency. There's not a time in the world where you just need something from Victoria's Secret. Be for real. You could do without <laughs> that. That's not a necessity, right? So you having retail cards ties you to overspending at said store. Two, carrying over balances or like viewing your credit card as something that you don't have to worry about right now. Like, oh, I'll pay that later or I'll pay it off in payments. You should never approach your credit card or a per you should never approach purchasing something on your credit card with the ideal in mind that, oh, I'll pay this off over the course of 12 months. Baby, you can't afford it. And that's OK. Like, you can't afford it right now. But you're going to be happy that you were real with yourself and you know you 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 are not going to pay this back within the next 30 days so then you just don't get it you really could do without you really could do without a lot of things especially like like i said in that first two years you are going to have to sacrifice a lot of things but you are building great financial habits and it's going to pay off that's the thing until you kind of go through that probational period you're never going to make it to the point where you are having in it uh where you have extremely good credit you you're not gonna make it to that point without good financial habits you are not you are not so just that 24 months you're on probation be militant about your credit cards if you've messed up in the past that's in the past it's done the only thing you can do is is build you know build now and then going forward um exemplify better financial habits OK, and it starts with your credit card, because like I said, credit cards are 30 percent of your credit profile. It's the second biggest, biggest factor. So it, don't mess up your like, don't be militant. That's all I got to say. Like, just be on probation. OK, now here's a screenshot of what kind of like process of paying your credit card. So step one, identify your due date. Step two, identify your statement date. Step three, pay your statement balance by your due date. That's only if you want to avoid paying interest, but there is always an option to make the minimum payment, although I don't suggest it because you are paying additional interest. However, if you're only concerned about like your credit score and you don't really care about paying a little, you know, a little extra interest, then OK, you can pay the minimum payment. However, if you want to pay as little as, as little interest as possible, pay if you pay your full statement balance by your due date, then you're not charged interest. Step four, make an extra payment assuming that you only made your minimum payment, make an extra payment to reduce your balance to under 10% of the limit by your statement date. Remember your due date comes first and then your statement date. Then step five, to maintain a, util a, a, a low utilization rate, refrain from using your credit card within 48 hours of your statement date. Because like I said, pending charges, um, pending transactions, you don't want anything to post unexpectedly you know, before that, that, that statement, the cycle closes. All right. Oh, hold on. I'm gonna give you 10 more seconds to, um, screenshot that. And then I just have a few more and then I'm gonna do Q and A. I've worked in the credit field for almost, oh, oh, are y'all still on? I've worked in the credit field for almost all of my career. Everything she is saying is on point. Shout out to you, Dave. Thank you. Um. All right. So y'all got that? Y'all got that? We're going to go to the next slide. Okay. If it goes. Okay. So here's an example. So identifying your statement date. A lot of people are unaware of what their statement date is. So I wanted to show an example. So here's a snapshot of a, a credit card statement. Some credit card statements will outright outright say here is your statement date or they'll sometimes they'll know they'll uh word it as cycle closing date it all means the same thing so some banks will outright tell you here's your statement date here's your next reporting date here's your closing here's your here's your cycle closing date they all mean the same thing however some banks won't so they, they they'll just you know identify like your your due date or whatever however every credit card statement will have your statement date you just have to find it Every credit card statement will include what's considered a billing period or a billing cycle. A billing cycle is a span of 30 to 31 days, depending on the month that you're in. And it will it has to outline because every credit card statement has to include 
the period, the cycle in which whatever transaction that they're listing occurred uh, within. So if they don't outright tell you your statement date, if you look at your billing cycle, the last day of your billing cycle is your statement date. So if you're looking at the screen, you'll see that the billing period was February 22nd to uh, March 21st. So that means that March 21st is my statement date for this particular card because every single credit card will be different. For this particular credit card, March 21st is my statement date. All the, and then it, as you can see, according to the statement, my due date is on the 17th. So yes, your statement date and your due date could be within five days. Like it, it could be, it could be close because it all depends on like what time during the month that you open that credit card. So it'll vary depending on like, you know, the company or whatever. So this particular company, there is only a five day difference. Is that five? Yeah. There's only a five day difference between my uh, due date, which is the 17th, and then my statement date, which is the 21st. So what that tells me or what that should tell you is my due date is on the 17th. My statement date is on the 21st. That's only a four day time span. So you ain't there's not much time. What I would do to be safe um, and on this card, what I regularly do is after the due date, like I just pay, I make sure that my balance is below 10 percent by my due date. And then I just put this card. Like, I just don't use this card until the 18th. I mean, I'm sorry, until um the 22nd, until my statement date has surpassed. Because they're so close. It's just too, it's too much to be like, okay, I got 24 hours to spend something. I, it's too, it's literally four days apart. So that's too close for comfort to pretty much make a difference. So I just pretty much not use this card for about like four days out of the month, just because they're so close. However, I do have other credit cards where my statement date is like two weeks. It's a two week difference. So that's, you know, that's more time. But because they're so close, whatever I pay on my due date, I just allow to post on my statement date. I just, I, you know, I just carry it over or whatever. All right. So then here's another example. American Express. They will show, they will outright out, they will outright say your closing date is this. And then here's your next closing date. So as you can see on the screen, um, my closing date is on the third of the month. Um, however, my due date is on the 28th, obviously of the month prior. So that's still only about five days difference. Um, in this particular, um, I don't know what card this is. I was going to, uh, actually, I don't know what card. This, no, this, this is not a charge card because it has a limit. So if you look over where it says interest charges, if you see, Interest charges are zero simply because I don't pay interest. I'm not paying interest. If I don't, I, I'm, I'm not paying anything extra than what I have to pay. And that's just it. Um, but as you can see, I, again, you can see how, how many, char how um, the amount of charges that I, that I um, made on this particular credit card, which in that particular month is old, but in that particular, this is a business card as well. So that'll, you know, on this particular card in that month, um, I spent over fifteen thousand dollars. However, I didn't pay. I didn't pay a cent. I didn't pay a single cent in interest, simply because I paid my credit card properly. I made sure that I took care of my statement balance by the due date. I mean, by the I, I didn't carry over anything, right? Um, but this is just to show you that even with higher limit credit cards or whatever, I don't even know what the limit was on this credit card at the time. Oh, okay, it was it was only twenty thousand at this time, but. I do. I, I I behave the same way with my two hundred dollar credit cards as I do my um, like I have a credit card for ninety six thousand. Same rule apply. Same rule. I'm not spending anything that I cannot repay, like pay back. Right. Um. The point is, you are able to use your credit card heavily. Like you are able to to have heavy usage on your credit card and still have a low utilization reported simply by understanding the differences and knowing when and how to pay your credit card. I don't pay interest. I say that all the time. As you can see, I don't pay interest. I'm not paying interest because I'm I'm frugal when it comes to extra charges. All right. Now, another question that I get a lot when it comes to credit cards, it's going to be saved on YouTube. Another, another question that I um, get a lot when it comes to credit cards is, on my credit card statement, there are two balances. There is a statement balance and then there's a current balance. What is the difference? Which one do I pay, et cetera? So if you look at the screenshot to the right, <laughs> the right, look at the screenshot to the right, you will see um, a statement balance and then you will see a current balance. If you're wondering the difference between the two, because each credit card statement will have both. 
Your statement balance is the balance at the end of the previous cycle. So again, that was the balance um, that was on your statement date. That was, that was the balance that was reported to the credit bureaus. It does not include any pending charges or payments that, re that was received after that statement was generated. Okay, so your statement date came, the door shut, the statement was generated. Anything that was pending went to the next cycle. So your statement balance is as of whenever your last billing statement or credit card statement was, was generated, okay? The difference between your statement balance and your current balance is your current balance is the amount that you owe towards your credit card, including any pending charges, fees, interest, or and also uh, minus any payments that was received. So it's the current balance. Basically, it's your statement balance minus any or your statement balance and then plus any other charges that occurred after that statement generated and also any payments that you pay before um before this time it'll also include that so it's basically it's basically like your up-to-date real-time balance what you owe on a credit card do y'all get the difference so your statement date is based on your last generated statement your last cycle at the end of your billing cycle if you are only worried or concerned about avoiding interest, you only need to pay your statement balance because they can't charge you interest on any of your current charges if they have not exceeded 30 days being on your credit card. So they don't just charge you interest the second that you swipe your credit card. That's not how interest works. They, your, your bank can only charge you interest on the balances or the charges that you carry over. OK, so if you are getting your if you're looking at your credit card bill and you see the statement balance and then the current balance. If you take care of the statement balance, then you don't you're not going to be charged interest. Right. Um, which one should you pay? The statement balance will clear the statement balance, which prevents carrying over any balance to the next cycle. This helps you avoid paying interest. So, like again, as long as you take as long as you take care of your statement balance, by um, then you are not going to be charged interest. Now, if you want to if you want to, you know, if you want to get ahead, you could pay your current balance, paying your current balance settles the current balance which covers your statement balance and then any recent charges made after that statement period this particular um this is ideal for people who regularly spend on their credit card so like me if you live off your credit card it's a great idea to keep up with your balance like because you don't you don't ever want to have one have to have to pay an extremely high bulk payment towards your credit card Whereas you can make, you know, small payments throughout the month so that you are never like overwhelmed by the amount that you need to pay. So I regularly just just make payments, like I said, um, and then my I typically will take care of my current balance just to get ahead to the next month. However, I'm not gaining any extra points by, you know, getting ahead to the next month. It's simply just, you know, because I use my credit card so much, I just don't want to be overwhelmed by a $16,000 bill that's due in one day. You get, you know what I'm saying? So just make a habit of, of, of you can either pay your statement balance and you've done exactly what you need to do. Like th that, I, again, you don't get any extra points by paying the current balance. However, if you are regularly spending on your credit card, it is a good idea to get in the habit of, of taking care of your, your current balance. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so let's talk about credit utilization. I think you guys pretty much know this, but I wanted to include it. What is credit utilization? A lot of people, I get a, I get this question a lot because I don't think a lot of people understand. So credit utilization is calculated as the percentage of credit that you are currently utilizing compared to the total, compared to your total available credit. So to determine your, your credit utiliza, utilization ratio, what you would do is you would divide your statement balance by your total credit limit and then you'll get your credit utilization so if you have if if we have a credit card with a 200 dollars limit in our statement balance i'll ask y'all actually we'll, we'll do a pop quiz really quick if we have a 200 dollars credit card and then we have a statement balance of a hundred dollars that's too easy. If we have a $200 credit card and then we have a statement balance of $50, what is our utilization? Also, we want another important thing to know about utiliz utilization. Your utilization is only updated once a month. One time per month. Yeah, I'm waiting on the answer. And hold on, because I didn't even do the math in my head yet. <laughs> okay, wait. 200. We got a $200 limit and then our statement balance is 50 
I got it. I heard, I see 50%, 25. It's 25%. It's 25% because uh it's 25%. <laughs> uh yeah, so 25%. So yeah, that's your that's how you calculate your utilization. You take you take your total and then so there's a thing called overall utilization, which takes into account all of your credit cards and all of your balances. Um, and that's what's what you see like when you log into your credit monitoring app, you'll see your overall utilization. So you'll take your all of your uh statement balances on all of the open credit cards that you have, and then you'll divide it by the total credit limits that you have amongst like all of your, your credit cards, and that's how you'll get your your credit utilization. Have I had y'all more than it's been two hours? Y'all, I'm not even done. Do y'all want to come back tomorrow? It's been two hours. Uh oh my goodness. Y'all good or what? Y'all want me to keep going? I I I told y'all I was gonna keep y'all for an hour, child. We didn't did a whole freaking. I really just got a few more though. Keep going. Okay. Let me check my batteries. Oh, the camera died. All right. So we're gonna keep going. Dang, two hours is crazy. Okay. Oh, let me. I'm a. I'm a breeze through the rest. Oh, <laughs> all right. So, what is the what is what is an ideal credit utilization rate during your building phase? So, if you can, if you look at the screen, you will see um, tiers or thresholds. Right, one to three percent is the premier range. Like, if you really are dedicated to growing your credit score as as fast as possible, um, or you are about to apply for anything, whether that's a credit card, a car, a home, whatever. The best thing you could do is to lower your utilization between one and three percent the month prior to you applying. That's the best thing you could do. Uh, even if you have collections, even if you have derogatory accounts, the best thing you could do is lower it to between one and three percent because then you are actually maximizing your credit score based on everything that's on your credit profile. So if you ever want to see like how high your credit score could get based on like your collections and stuff like that, report a one to 3% utilization. And like I said, you do have to do it the, the, the month prior to your application simply because, um, again, your, util your utilization in your credit, your true credit report is only updated every 38 days. So it's not as, um, it's not as active as like credit monitoring apps wants us to believe like every time you log in every time something changes on your credit report you're getting an alert from like credit karma or you know whatever credit monitoring app you use that's not how our credit reports work you you are actually only issued a update to your credit report every 30 fico issues an update every 38 days so if you just paid off your if you just paid down your utilization let's say you know two weeks ago it's a chance that you're not going to see a change to your credit score or see it reflected on your credit report for like another 30 days or whatever, like another 20 plus days. It's only generated once a month, one time per month. OK. Um. So one to three percent is excellent. Four to nine percent is great. So if you are not actively applying for anything and you're just like building credit reporting, you know, under nine percent is good. Like you good. But if you are doing a credit application, I would suggest one to three percent. OK, now 10 to 30 percent. It's, it's, 10 is cool, but I'm saying like the closer you get to 30, like as you can see, 30 to 50 percent is, is literally just OK. Um, I liken it to I, I make this comparison all the time because I think that it, 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 it. I feel like most people will understand it better. Reporting a 30 percent utilization on your credit report or your credit profile is the same as getting like a C in school, right? So when you get a C on a test, you didn't fail the test. No, of course. Or if you get a C in a class, you're not failing the class. But are you excelling in the class? No, you're you're kind of just, you're average. You're in the middle. You're, you're just floating by. If you have a bad grade in a class, let's say you have a, F, a, a, a D in a class and you are trying to raise your, your grade so that you are, you know, you're trying to raise your grade. Your goal on the test wouldn't be a C, right? No, it wouldn't. You would try to get like an A so that you can average out and, you know, pull up your score a little bit. That's the same thing as a credit card. When you report a 30% utilization, it's literally you just doing enough. Like it's, it does not do anything for your credit profile. It keeps it stagnant. 
uh, if you have bad credit, it does not cause it to grow. It it just keeps you like floating. Like you really just like floating. Um, it's like you doing. It's like it's really like you doing just enough to not get in trouble type of thing. So that's what a thirty reporting a thirty percent is. And child, anything outside of thirty percent, no, we ain't, we don't even have to um, entertain it. No, again, I know the industry standard is thirty percent. I know it. Let that go because you are never going to get have great credit with reporting a 30%. You're not. Let it go. Forget about it. Forget you. Unlearn that. Understand that responsible credit use and, and, and credit utilize, utilization uh, percentages that will help your credit score grow, especially if you have bad credit. You, you don't have the wiggle room to report no 30%. That's insane. You That means that you literally don't want your credit score to grow. Like It's just not going to grow. It's going to stay there. You may get a, you may uh, obtain a few points here and there, but your credit score overall is not going to to increase. Dang sure your borrowing power is not. So if you have bad credit, the worse your credit is, the worse your credit profile is, the more you need to make sure that you're hitting as close to that one one to three percent as possible. But like I said, under nine percent, that you you still doing good. I'm that's still good. What time is it? 11 o'clock. All right. So we already talked about this short-term installments and long-term installments. The difference is short-term installments are 36 months or less. And then long-term installments are 36 months or more. I don't know why that says 24. I was rushing. Here are examples of short-term installments. Self, Money Lion, Navy Federal Pledge Loan, Credit Strong, Republic, Republic Bank, your local bank or credit uh, union. So when you are building credit and you're trying to meet that, you know, credit profile threshold, Get a short-term installment from one of these, uh, one of these, what'd you call it? I guess banks. Um, and also these do not require established credit. So if you have bad credit, if you have, if you don't have credit, these are the, the, um, credit accounts that will still lend to you, give you a short-term installment so that they can report to all three bureaus and help you build credit. Even if you have bad credit, right? So get one of these. They range from between 25 to I think like $50 a month. Um, the only thing that you need to be concerned about is it's over 20. You want it, you want it over 12 months. So as long as it's under 36 months and over 12 months, that's going to help you build credit. Self is self is an easy one for anyone. Like even if you're post bankruptcy, credit strong is the same thing. Um All right, so real quick, we're just going to go over the credit cards and then, yeah, I am going to end it because I didn't know this was this one. Okay, so let's talk about credit cards. If you have applied for credit cards and you have failed to get approved for them and you are wondering, like, I can't get approved for anything, I can't build credit, so I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm going to give options for each credit profile. Um, there are five tiers of credit cards. There are subprime, there are starter cards, there are mid-tier cards, top-tier cards, and then invitation-only cards. Subprime cards are tailored for individuals with negative credit history or recent negative remarks, meaning you have recent collections, charge-offs, late payments. You have a history of negative credit account, negative um, credit, right? You have a history of that. So if you cannot get approved for even a starter card, if you're getting if you if you're getting denied for secure cards, then you you need to understand that your credit profile only qualifies you to get a subprime card at this time, and that's okay. Get it, have it for at least a year, then you could close it. But you need to, you still need to get it so that you are able to build credit and, and, and get some of those credit utilization points, right? Um, so again, subprime cards, you're what what can you expect? High interest, secure credit lines. So you're gonna have to secure your lines. And those are those are those are considered dead end cards, meaning they typically don't graduate, they don't grow. Um, is it's the last option. So if you can't get approved for traditional cards. Then you would apply for a subprime card. You fresh out of bankruptcy. Then you apply. You would apply for a subprime card, right? Only do it if you have to, and also low limits. However, none of that matters because what what does matter is that they report to all three credit bureaus. That's all. That's the only thing you need. You need them to report to all three credit bureaus. And the options that I'm going to give you will report to all three credit bureaus. And all you need to do is make sure that you are paying it, as we just suggested. And if you missed it, go and watch it on YouTube. Um. Be responsible with it. Have all you need. You need to have it for at least, at least, at the very minimum, nine months. But a year, you might as well just keep it for a year. But have it at least nine months before you close it. So, like, and if you do decide to close it, 
um make sure that you are approved and you already have another credit card before you close it don't don't close it and then apply for another credit card no all a, a subprime card's job is is to help you establish credit don't expect much out of them nor is they expecting much out of you because they will approve you with bad credit they will approve you with a with a bad a negative credit history that's great because a credit card is a credit card it doesn't matter if it's 200 dollars a subprime or starter it does the same thing as a $30,000 credit card, a $20,000 credit card. You just need the presence of a revolving trade line on your credit report so that you can um, maximize the credit points in your credit utilization category, which is 165, okay? Get that if you have bad credit or recent derogatories, okay, cool. Then the next level up is starter cards. Starter cards are for those individuals who either have a thin credit profile or no, no credit. Like if you have never built credit, maybe you have an auto loan or maybe just student loans. You don't have bad credit, though. You just have a minimal to no credit history. Then you can do a starter card. Starter cards are like student cards, right? Or secure cards for, like I said, people. it doesn't matter the age, but just people who have a very limited credit history. Um, starter cards, you can expect secure credit lines. So most starter cards, you do have to secure the line. So you have to put up a, you know, $200 to have a $200 credit limit. Invest in your credit. Like there is no reason why you should you should avoid securing a credit line because that little two hundred dollar credit card is going to do a lot for your credit profile it's absolutely worth it don't try to just wait until you are going to be approved for a mid-tier card because how you think you're gonna ever get there you got to build credit right so invest in it the most that you need to do is get two starter cards or two subprime cards you should never hear me never get more than two subprime or two starter cards the limit to subprime and starter cards are two two Anything outside of that for what you you should just need you need to just wait until you establish credit until you are qualified to get a traditional mid tier card because there's no reason to have a bunch of starter and subprime cards because like I said they are limited like even with starter cards some will graduate however the the ceiling the limit to those to those cards are typically under two thousand dollars like they're not really gonna grow you ain't gonna get no you ain't gonna turn you ain't gonna turn no starter card into like a thirty thousand dollar trade line it's just not gonna happen again that's not what it's for it's literally to help you establish credit right now after starter card you have mid-tier cards that's that's where credit cards start to get fun that's when you're gonna start to um get reward points and and cash back this is actually my favorite tier of card it's it's the mid-tier cards are typically tailored to like the everyday spender your grocery like it, it gives you a bunch of points for groceries and gas and uh casual shopping and all of that right these are like I said, to me, the best cards with with mid tier cards, you're going to get that's going to be majority of the reward cards. You're going to have great credit limits. Mid tier cards can can reach up to like sixty, seventy thousand dollars each, depending on you know the card that you get. It has a very high growth potential. Mid tier cards are the cards that you're going to keep forever, most likely. Um, they either have a very low annual fee or like or none. Some a lot of mid tier cards don't have any annual fees. However, those are going to be the cards that you're probably going to keep forever forever so that's where like credit that's where you like it gets fun right and then the next step up from mid-tier cards are top tier cards everybody thinks that they want a top tier car until they realize what comes with it so yeah you'll get the high limits you'll get the best rewards and great incentives and specialty cars and stuff like that but you'll also get a, a high annual fee right so the difference between a top tier and a mid-tier car is top tier cars you're gonna pay an annual fee for for good top tier cards if, if it's a top tier card and it does not have an annual fee, understand that it's probably a mid tier card because the reason why top tier cards have annual fees is because they give you so many rewards that, you know, they got to justify it. You know, they, they got to make their money somehow and they'll charge you like, for example, the Amex uh, Platinum card is a is a top tier card. The annual fee is um $600. Is it? Yeah, $600. The Amex Gold card, the annual fee is like $350. However, when you break down all the benefits to the car, it pays for itself. And if you know how to properly use the car, you know, yes. But don't get a top tier card if you don't understand what that card is to be used for, because it's typically like specialty cards, flight cards, uh, hotel cards, stuff like that. So if you don't, if you are not getting that card because of the benefits, then don't get the card. Don't get an Amex Platinum card if you're not a frequent traveler, because you're going to be paying a $600 annual fee. And you ain't even getting the benefits from the car. So what's the point? Because all the benefits tailored towards travelers. So don't get it if you don't travel, right? 
Um, this is why I tell everybody, like, I know mid-tier sounds like it's lesser in comparison to a top tier. Mid-tier cars are going to be the cars that you had the most. Like, I have mo I have more mid-tier cars than I have top-tier cars. There ain't no really no point in getting too many top-tier cars, because for what? How, how many hotels do you stay at? How many, how many, you know, airlines do you fly? At this point, you just paying annual fees. So top tier, like I said, they're great for specialty cars, like flights, getting miles, and all of that. And then the next bet, the next tier is the invitation only cars. And those are credit cards that are available only to, towards individuals that meet a specific el eligibility requirement or criteria. And you have to be invited to apply. All right. So what are example of um, what I didn't do the subprime. I got to go get the subprime. Yeah, hold on. Well, okay, I'll, I'm going to circle back to subprime. I was doing my presentation fast. So here is a list of uh, like my favorite starter cards. So again, if you don't have bad credit, but you just, you have limited credit or a thin credit profile here are one, two, this is like what, 10 options that you can uh, apply for. So if you have a, a, a young adult that's starting to build credit, like a child, right? This is a great list for them to start. Discover it secured, Capital One Platinum, the Pedal 2 Visa. City Secured MasterCard, uh, Capital One Quicksilver, Capital One Platinum, Chase Freedom Student, Self Secured, Chime Credit Builder. So these are all options for, like I said, individuals who don't have bad credit. They just have limited credit. I'm going to give you out a subprime list. I don't know why I didn't include it, but I'll give it to you. Um, I'm going to get it now, child, because I'm going to forget. Let me just let me just get it now. Hold on. Give me one second. Um, wrong account, wrong account, wrong account. I'm getting sleepy, but I ain't going nowhere, okay? Oh, that's what I was looking for. All right, so can y'all see this? I have lost y'all. Okay, here you go. Wait, wait, wait. Where y'all at? Where y'all at? Okay. Uh, give me one moment. I'm pulling it up right now. All right. So, uh, where is it? Invitation starter. Hold on, y'all. Yeah. Um, I'm tired as hell. Okay, okay, well, wait, wait. I do got it though. I do got it. See this? I, I make so many things on presentations. I always be having. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Right. Here. How do I just download this page? I was gonna screenshot a child. I ain't got time. All right. So here's a list of the prom. How do I switch this? Oh. Okay, can y'all see that? Can y'all see that list? Let me know if y'all can see that on uh, YouTube. Can y'all see the subprom list? Y'all can or no? Y'all can't see it? Is it too small? 
Okay, you can see it now. Okay, yeah. So this is this is the subprom list. Okay, so um, if you have bad credit, so if you have recent derogatory accounts, collections, charge-offs, and you can't get approved for, um, you know, like Capital One, Discover, or whatever, there are still options. So Premier Bank Card, Open Sky, uh, Credit One Platinum, Fortiva MasterCard, Merrick Bank, Indigo MasterCard, the Pedal One Card. So the Pedal Two Card was on the starter list. However, if you have, if you if you're in a subprime market, go to Pedal One. Uh, the Tomo credit card, the Bank of America secure card, the Milestone MasterCard, and then the Surge secured. Um, not on YouTube. See, some people saying no, some people saying yes. So y'all confusing me. Okay, y'all don't see it for real? How are some people seeing it and some people not? So I'll just repeat the list then. Oh, y'all do see it? I think some people maybe are behind, like whatever. So, so a list, the list of subprime card, Premier Bank card, Open Sky, Credit One Platinum, Fortiva Mastercard, Merrick Bank, Indigo Mastercard, Pedal One Visa, Tomo Credit Card, Bank of America Secure Card, Milestone, and then Surge. So subprime cards, like I said, are tailored to individuals who have bad credit. So they don't require you to have a certain credit score. It doesn't matter what your credit score is. It doesn't matter, you know, how bad your credit profile is. These are going to be cards that are literally tailored towards, you know, bad credit profiles. Um, none of these cards are going to give you the bells and whistles, as I stated. So don't expect it. And all you need is them to report to all three credit bureaus in which all of these cards does. Um, so, yeah, fresh out of bankruptcy, can't get approved for any other card, fresh collections and all of that apply for um yeah I really can't see oh yeah okay refresh oh okay I, I I'm guessing they saying yeah I need to refresh so yeah um okay I'm gonna move on now because we gotta get back to just I think we got like two more slides like it's we we don't have a lot I promise I promise. All right. Now, again, that was the subprime card. And then the starter cards. Here's the list again in case you need to uh, screenshot. Okay. Then mentor cards. Like I said, there are a lot of more cards that I could have added to this list, but these are like my favorite, my personal favorite. So mentor cards, the Chase Freedom Flex. Uh, real quick. Do not apply for a mentor card unless you have at least 12 months history uh, from either a, 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 from, you know, a starter card for the best results. You may get approved like there are always going to be exceptions to rules. So you may get approved for these prior to then. However, if you want like a really good offer um, and, and a really good limit, then I would suggest waiting at least 12 months, which is why I said after you like if you get a mentor card and you are coming from a subprime or a starter card, you can close that card after you get approved. After you get approved. Don't close it before you apply for these cards, though. Okay? Because it's just a stepping block. The, the starter in the, in, the, in the, well, really, the subprime is just a, a stepping block. The starter card, again, you I would not recommend you close it. But if you if you want to, you could. I would not recommend it, though, especially if it does not have an annual fee. Okay, cool. Um, Midter cards, Chase Freedom Flex, Chase Freedom Unlimited. And this is no particular order, by the way. Uh, Chase Sapphire Preferred, American Express Gold Card, American Express Blue um, Everyday Card, Blue Blue BCP, City Double Cash, City Custom Cash. The City Double Cash is one of my favorites. Uh, all, basically, all of Navy Federal cards are considered military cards. Um, and then Capital, the Capital One Venture. So I, I'm not referring to the Venture X nor the Venture One, just the Venture. You know, they got like a thousand variations of the Venture card and they're all trash, but they're not all trash, but yeah. Um, so here, here are like like the top mentor cards. Um, again, with mentor cards, the, the again, this is gonna be the best cards. Like you're gonna get the most rewards. Um, some of most of them have an annual fee, but they're like small. If they do have an annual fee, the rewards, the benefits outweigh for sure the annual fee. Um, and these are gonna be like your everyday cards. So the cards that you are frequently using should be these cards simply because all of them have rewards. All of them, all of their the rewards aid to like everyday spending. 
like, you know, grocery shopping, um, casual shopping. Um, what else we spend our money on, child? Uh, Amazon, uh, you know, everything that we you that most people, you know, spend on a day to day basis, uh, DoorDash and all of that. Right. Um, so th these are and it's no limit to how many of these cars you can get. Now, don't uh, don't get 10 in a year. That's insane. Right. You want to. It's a such thing as building too fast. So six months between each application is best practice. And then, you know, yeah. So basically two of these a year if you want, if you want, but you don't have to, obviously. Um, but there is a limit to starter and subprime cars. Never exceed two. Never exceed two. Because after that, what you it's no point. It's no point. Um, and then here are my favorite top tier cards: the Amex Platinum card, the Chase Sapphire Reserve. The United Club Infinite Card, the IHG Rewards Premier Card, the Delta Sky Miles Platinum Card, uh, the, Mar the Marriott Bonvoy Brilliant Card, and then the Capital One Venture X Card are like the most. And then it's one that I left off this list, and I don't know why, but the City Premier Card is has has like has really earned a place in my in my heart lately. Within like the last year, I I use that pretty much more than almost any card on this list, actually. Um, so yeah, so the, the city reserves, put that on there, or I'm sorry, the city premiere, the city premiere, city premiere. So those are like my favorite top tier cards. Um, and again, there are more, would Navy federal, would Navy federal Amex card be considered a top tier? So I will put all Navy federal cards on the mid tier, not anything against it, but no, like all of their cards will be on mid tiers. Um, and then invitation only cards. You got to be invited to apply. So, child, we ain't got to spend a lot of time on this. Everyone knows about the black card, which is the Amex Centurion card, the JP Morgan Reserve card, the Stratus White card, the City Chairman card, um, the, du the Dubai First Royale card, and then the Master MasterCard Gold card. So these are, again, invitation only. You have to be invited to apply. You have to spend like a certain amount. And, child, the, the Centurion card, the black card, has a $10,000 annual fee. <laughs> it's insane, right? A $10,000 annual fee. Um, one and this is the last slide before, yeah, this is the last slide. So, what is a reconsideration line? So, a reconsideration line is a back office number to a to a to a credit card or a bank's credit card application department that um can review your application after a denial. So, if you are denied for a credit card, um, always ask for a reconsideration, and you do this by calling the specialized number. So this is not something that most companies publicly advertise. However, there are back, well, we, well you may hear it as backdoor numbers, but it's just their um, reconsideration line. So it allows you to please your case and it adds a personal touch to the approval process. So as you guys know, when you are applying, when we are applying for credit, everything is systematic. Everything is ran through a system and banks will outline um, yeses and nos, right? So things that'll, that'll automatically cause you to have a denial, and then things that they'll accept, right? So everything is systematic. Depending on what's on your credit profile, you'll you'll get a decision within like ten seconds, right? If you are denied based on a system, you are able to call the back office number and ask for a reconsideration. A reconsideration will allow a human to view your application, right? So then you're able to justify certain things. If you've ever purchased a home. And you may have heard of what's called a letter of explanation. It's basically just like you justifying why you have a late payment or why you why why something is wrong. Um, and then it'll basically you're pleading your case, right? So with the reconsideration line, the same thing applies, but you have to call within 30 days. You have to call within 30 days because um after 30 days, they can no longer use your current credit application, like your current credit report. Cause like I said, your credit report is updated once a month. They can only use the most recent. So if, if you don't call, if you if you allow 30 days to pass, then they have to pull your credit again. You don't want two inquiries to possibly still get denied again. No, you have to call within 30 days so that they're basing their um, review on your application that they already have possession of. And companies only keep if you are denied, companies only keep your application on file for 30 days legally. So you have to call within that 30 days. Um, screenshot. And I'm definitely not going to repeat all these numbers. So if you're on like TikTok or Instagram, you got to like go to, just wa go watch the YouTube video when it's done. It, it'll be like towards the end. So these are just popular reconsideration numbers. So for American Express, Bank of America, Barclay, Capital One, Chase, Citibank, Discover, U.S. Bank. Who is that? Wells Fargo. 
so yeah so if you are denied for one of these credit cards instead of just accepting the denial at face value always try to get a reconsideration because it's not gonna hurt you it doesn't hurt you it's not like you are getting another inquiry um 32 32 or 31 i can't remember but like basically 30 percent of denials turn to approvals after calling a reconsideration line that's a to me that's a large percentage i don't know about y'all but that's a large percentage um so 30 percent of the time you have a 30 percent chance of reversing your denial simply by calling a reconsideration line and asking for a person to review your application. And then you can justify things. Let's say you have a you have three collections two years ago. Hey, you know, two years ago, I was furloughed due to COVID. Like I lost my job, I lost my employment. Since then, as you can see, based on my current accounts, because understand that you have to obviously be building credit. You gotta, you gotta justify it, right? So you gotta show that you I have either learned and are now um you know, better, like per your credit report, like your credit report literally shows like your active credit, your open accounts, you, you're currently doing better. Um, if you're not, then child, don't waste, don't, don't even waste your time because that's pointless. But if you, uh, you can say things like, you know, I was furloughed, furloughed due to COVID, lost my employment. Um, but since then, as you can, as you can see, based on my current accounts, I have been, I, I, I've managed my credit well. I've reported a low utilization, did it, I did it, all right. Also, another reason or another way that you can use the reconsideration line is if you do get approved, but you get approved for a small amount or an amount that you feel as though your credit profile exceeds. Like you, If you feel like based on your other accounts that you should qualify for a higher trade line or a higher credit limit, then hit the reconsideration line. I've done this multiple times. I actually do this every time that's between me and you. Everything that they they approve me for off the bat, I'm always calling. Ding, ding, ding. Thank you. I, I appreciate, you know, I appreciate you approving me. However, based on my credit history, based on my all of my current accounts, based on my um, credit utilization, I, I'm mentioning everything. There is a clear, there like it's very clear that I am not a, a, a risk at all, right? Like, so you don't have to worry about me not paying because you don't see any... Thing on my credit report that will lead you to believe that I won't pay, that I that I that I that I'm not a responsible borrower. borrower. Um, therefore, this line that you approved me for, it's almost it's almost a slap in the face based on the rest on my other accounts that I got. So why why are you approving me for ten thousand dollars when I have multiple twenty thousand dollar plus credit lines, right? Like so, I'll say things like that. Um, in order for this account to even be worth it, like it's not even at this point, it's not even worth it for me to accept this account because I'm going to lose credit age, right? When I can go to A company, B company, and they'll give me a higher trade line, as you can see. And I will say like maybe eight out of 10 times that I, I've tried it, it's always worked, always. So if you really are establishing credit and got and, and have like, like your credit profile is popping, like you can show and you can back up whatever you're saying, companies definitely are willing to give you more. A lot of times the automated system will just, you know, assign you a certain amount just because, just for, so like I've had, like maybe, I remember one time it was because like I had too many inquiries and y'all know I don't care about inquiries. I don't even challenge my inquiries. There has been times where I've had like 16 inquiries because I, I'm going to compare rates. I don't care. I, there's never going to be an inquiry more important to me, like making sure that I got the best offer, right? So there has been times where I've had like 16 inquiries and I'm applying for a card and they have, they approved me for a certain amount. And, I'm, and I knew it was based on inquiries, based on the amount. And I'm calling like, hey, yeah, I know you see these inquiries, but that's simply because I'm I'm being a responsible borrower. I'm making sure that I am getting the best um best approval so that I can, you know, et cetera, right? And then they always approve me for more. Always. I call I, I do the same. Let's say I apply for a credit limit increase. Let them not approve me. Oh, they're getting an email and they're getting a phone call to the reconsideration line. Because when your credit profile speaks for itself, you got a lot of leverage. You have a lot of leverage. You have a lot of lever leverage. Um, y'all, I was going to do Q&A, but I'm sleepy and I got to get up at five o'clock. I have to get up at five o'clock in the morning, y'all. So I, we can't do Q&A tonight. I did not know this presentation was going to be almost three hours. I really did not. So we can make a deal. I'll come back tomorrow and we can do Q&A. But child, the way my, my energy is on, my tank is, is zero. I need to, I'm, I'm tired. So tomorrow we'll do Q&A. Rewatch the presentation, all of that, and you know, write down your questions or whatever the case may be. And I will come live tomorrow. It will be during school hours. 
what I got to do tomorrow. Yeah, it'll be during school hours. So again, it's, it'll be Q and A time. The only stupid questions are the ones that you do not ask. There are I don't consider any credit questions stupid because I understand that we are not taught credit. So I just want I always have to say that for you know people scared of asking certain things or scared of sounding stupid. There is no way you can sound stupid. There is no stupid credit question because we were not taught this. You were not taught it. It's not it's not widely known. Every question is acceptable, but not tonight. <laughs> But not tonight because your girl is tired and I'm I'm very tired. So I hope you guys learned something. If you learn at least one thing, then put a one in the chat or something. Or like the actually like the video. Like the video. Can we send a super chat? No, don't don't send I yeah, I don't send me no super chat for real. Don't don't do that. Just like the video. That's how you could pay me. Like the video and then like follow whatever platform you're you're on. Don't waste your money sending me. Don't waste your money sending me super chats. I'm super blessed. I'm just happy y'all learned. That's that's the goal. Um, can I pay for a question? No, don't don't. I need to turn it off. Don't don't pay. Don't you don't have to pay for a question because you can get it answered for free. Just not tonight because I'm tired. I'm very tired. Yeah, turn on turn on turn on your notifications on YouTube because I I do a lot of like webinars, impromptu webinars. Um, so if you're interested in learning about credit and you enjoy the way that I teach and you actually learn, then yeah, definitely, definitely subscribe. I hope you saw my cigarette. No, I'm so sorry. I wasn't even looking at it. That's another reason why. Yeah, because I be so focused on a presentation. I don't even be paying attention. And, and then I go back and watch and be like, oh my God, I didn't even tell that person. Thank you. So thank you if you did, but don't ever, ever feel obligated to send me anything. Never. But send me a like. That's the only thing I want. A like and a follow. That's all. That's all. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm sleepy. I'm sleepy. I need to go to bed because I got to get up at five and I will be live. Um, I'll put it on my story because I don't know. I, I know I got to meet at 10, so it's most likely going to be after 10. All right, so hold your questions and I hope you guys, like I said, learned something. Rewatch it. It'll be saved on YouTube. You can watch it, share it with your friends, sister, cousin. Everybody need to have good credit. Everybody, everybody has access to good credit. They just don't have the information. So, yeah, um, I will talk to you guys tomorrow. I hope you guys have an amazing, an amazing, peaceful, restful night of sleep. Um, God bless you all. So, yeah, I will talk to you guys tomorrow. And I will save this on YouTube. My YouTube page is Shonda Martin. All right. Good night. Bye bye, YouTube.